on this episode of the Roundtable Podcast brought to you by Manscaped, uh, MaxEverMuscle.com, and Sam Adams. And, yeah. Listen, <laughs> and the Arms Army. Shout out. Shout out. <laughs> An unbelievable story from how uh, Tyler C. Lover got to be our operations guy at Max Effort. And I think there's so much, so many things you can grab from this and it's super inspiring. Super inspirational story coming from ground zero gives plenty of context that you could probably relate to at some point. So it's the ultimate trailblazer. Yeah. It's just, it's just a banger episode. Just sit back and listen. Yeah. I think this is just a good reminder that everyone's got shit that they're going through and it's about getting through that. And like hearing these stories, this, if you got something going on, like you should be the example and try to help other people push through that. So this is a fucking banger episode. Yeah. I'm really glad that we asked them to be a guest today and thanks for sharing. All right, let's go to the show. Roundtable Podcast, I'm your boy Corey G at Small Arms, Danny at Trey Speed in the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak, brought to you by Manscaped. That's right. If you Shout would out. like 20% off of the amazing Manscaped uh, situation they're yeah. going to give you. The situation. Situation. Yeah. Shout like, out. Shout out Manscaped. You can hit this code. Unbelievable. Yeah. Best code of all time. It's Small Arms. All capitals at manscaped.com. You can spell it. With a Z. With a Z. With yeah. a Z. Yeah. Spell yeah. it, Dan. S-M-A-L-L-A-R-M-Z. Z like Zaddy. Like Zaddy. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, it's always brought to you by MaxEverMuscle.com and Sam Adams. And the Arms Army. And the Arms yeah, Army. Right. Shout out. Flex Shout out. And today, we have special guest, <laughs> Operations Man at Max Effort. Muscle Tyler C. Lover. What up, Tyler? Hey. How you guys What's doing? Up? What's up? What's up, Pop? I think it's time for... Uh, you know, Max Effort Mafia, the Round Table Podcast, all the people. Who the fuck is texting me right now? Uh, so so <laughs> <popular>. <laughs> <I know>. Hey, <laughs> like tell tell these supermodels to quit texting me. Uh, uh, anyway, he has, his, yeah. he has his phone set to like just go off. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn IG models. Um, problem, yeah. So I think it was time. Me and Cole were talking about this in the gym this morning uh, to get Tyler Sea Lover's uh, story out a little bit. Here's some uh, here's some processes of how he got here. Um, here's some of the things he's been through, how he's developed himself, and you know, at the end of the day, these pinpointed conversations we all learn more about each other. Yeah, and I think this is good because Tyler is super organized and honestly is way more put together than all of us. Facts. He operates in business all of us settings. <laughs> he yeah, oper- I would agree with that. He, he <laughs> operates like a true businessman of, of what you would expect in those settings, and it's really awesome. And now over the years, whenever he first came, he was like in this show. He was he he was he was Mr. Tyler C. Lover for sure. And now he's Mr. <laughs> Degenerate Tyler C. Lover, and it's and it's great to see. I, I was saying how like I thought he was fucking with me. Like literally because he was so like militant corporate, like yeah. he was doing what he's supposed to do. That's like right. when he comes to an interview or is around, but I thought it was like a front, but I'm like, this <laughs> motherfucker is for real, but he's really to get like, it, it's an amazing compliment to my personality. Uh, it's been amazing to have him here. Now he's in the ownership role too. And I'm going to find out if that's my fucking phone, You're good. but Danny, take it away. <laughs> oh, take it away. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Tyler's obviously a man of many talents. That's right. Some will mention some, maybe we won't mention. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's quiet. What? Uh, yeah. We don't want to start off with that. We'll get that's to that. After that's we tell the story. No, it's behind the premium paywall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Most by Tyler. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> anyway, what I was going to say is that I think some of uh, Tyler's like superpowers, at least I saw right off the bat is like, his ability to communicate and articulate his thoughts. Um, yeah, articulate. I think he sure. probably yeah. does that better than anybody here, for sure. Um, so maybe like maybe start there. So like, where did that kind of begin for you? Because you came from the engineering background, right? Yeah. Has absolutely. it always kind of been like that for you growing up, or? Yeah, I think in retrospect, um, the answer to that yeah. But first of all, these guys are being way too nice. <laughs> so I, I appreciate all of the intro and them laying it out like that. Um, Danny, I think we. I don't think we got. I think we got to start way back, bro. I right. think it's like. Where'd you grow up, Tyler? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah like where'd you go to like high school? Myself. Like, yeah, give yeah. us like real like <laughs> background, background. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy to go anywhere. Ask me. And then we'll the go there. And then we'll go there, Dave. Yeah. Um, so I grew up. So actually, I was born in Zanesville, Ohio, but that was just because it was the the closest hospital to where this little town was, that where um, most of my family grew up, which was called Roseville. Okay. And so um, I got a lot of love for Roseville. I How wish big I, is it? Dude, this this is how I always put it. No matter if this if it was 20, 30 years ago or if it's today, if you go around this whole town and you knock on every single door of every barely standing above ground building or structure you can find, 
I'll pay you money if you get 100 people to answer that door. <laughs> like, it's just there ain't nobody there. Got it. But I was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I grew up I grew up there, and then um, I went to high school not far away um, at Philo High School, which is in Duncan Falls, Philo, mm-hmm. Ohio. Um, and really, that came down to they were, they were like, rezoning the district, and they were kind of – because, like, like I was just describing, Roseville was such a small town to where um, they, they used to have a high school there. And then they took it away, shoot, I don't know, probably like in the late 70s, um, maybe early 80s. Um, and so basically once you got up to eighth grade after that, you had to make a decision. You could either go to another real small town to where I could like ride my bike to and they had a high school there, or you had to go to Philo. Got so it. it was either Crooksville, which is right next to oh, yeah. Philo, which is a little bit further away. Um, and so then by the time I got into junior high, they actually nixed it because they were trying to slowly roll it back even further. So not only did they get rid of that high school, um, they said, well, uh, you guys that are coming up. So actually when I was in seventh grade, the eighth grade class just ahead of me, um, they were the last eighth grade class to exist at Roseville because after that year they said, we don't even offer seventh or eighth grade anymore. All you guys are going to go to, uh, a different school. You're going to, you're going to have to pick. Mm -hmm. Um, and so some people even went to other schools that were still remotely close. They didn't just choose between Crooks or Philo. Um, so yeah, so that, that's, that's how that started. Um, so I actually, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of surprised that I actually ended up going to those schools because originally I wasn't, I wasn't going to. So I was born in Zanesville, kind of lived in Roseville with my, with my grand, my grandma for a little while. And then I want to say maybe around like the age of, I don't know, like one or two, um, my, my family moved again. And then I lived in, it was, it was probably like a Delaware address, Delaware, Ohio. And then I, for like preschool, kindergarten, first grade, I went to uh, Buckeye Valley East mm-hmm. actually, okay. which is in a small town called Ashley, which mm-hmm. is like Northeast of Delaware, mm-hmm. Ohio. Um, and then there was no plan. It was kind of an abrupt change that took me back to Roseville. And so then I didn't go to that school district until second grade, mm-hmm. which is still pretty darn early. Uh, but anyway, I, the long, the long of it is I actually wasn't really supposed to, that wasn't the plan. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how it ended up. Um, that's, that's kind of the school direction. Uh, what, what else can I answer before I just what, start? What was your life? So that. you mentioned like you were living with your grandma. Like what was your like home situation like? Uh, not great. Not great. So before let's just fucking lay it all out whatever you want to ask me i'm down just so you guys know please let's lay it all out well i think before you because i know most of the story but i think we'll learn more it's like you're gonna help people by showing what you've been through tyler yeah at the end of the day that's that's where the sauce is bro yeah um and honestly i'm kind of surprised that like this is how it's working out and i I know you're pretty good at reading between the lines but it's just kind of funny that you asked me to be on here today and then all this without me asking what's the subject matter this is what it ends up being yeah i already knew the subject matter when we asked (laughs) i've been i've been recollecting on a lot of this stuff it's been hit me really hit me really hard like not not necessarily in all bad way but like it's been flooding back and i'm like why why am i why am i recounting on all this right now yeah Probably because it, it, this will be this will be ten years at the end of May wow. that I graduated high school, which is crazy to say and crazy to believe, but I think that's probably why. But uh, but anyway, so to answer your question, Cole, so um, I like a lot of people. I was an accident baby. My my parents didn't plan me. They had me um, when they were like eighteen, nineteen, um, and they they had had ups and downs before they even had me so they they were together apart together apart in high school before they even had me um while my mother was pregnant with me and then my my dad wasn't there for my birth he actually um so you know we're situated in ohio i think he he got up and left and went down to like gulf shores alabama with one of his dudes because a dude he grew up with actually went down there uh, was, was living in Alabama for college. And so, you know, like I said, w- with all that turmoil going on, my parents not being together, he was like, well, he wasn't super committed at that time to, mm-hmm. uh, to being a father, I don't think. And so, um, that, that's kind of, that's, you can kind of get a picture a little bit of, of what that situation might've been like just leading up to me, just even coming into this world. And so shortly after me being born, I think they, they were, they were going to try to work it out, which, um, which led them to living in, in Roseville, which I was talking about growing up. And then uh, they were they were apart again. Like, I, I can't even tell you how many times, like, documented yeah. on paper, like, here's when they were together, here's when they weren't. But there was so much back and forth, which is what led to me being in Roseville, living in Delaware. I was living with my grandma, living with um, who was, I guess you could call my step-grandpa that my my grandma wasn't even together with anymore. There was just so much back and forth. And a lot um, of just instability. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and I had so much, I, I had such, so much friction 
um, without even realizing what it was coming from because you're so little yeah. and, and just trying to understand why I felt that way and trying to create stability and trying to create structure in my life. And that's so hard to do at such a young age mm-hmm. when you don't even understand where you're getting What's it supposed from. to What's look like? You? Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, yeah. Um, but the home life for sure, you know, that's the story of it. And like me- memories, memories don't even start forming for, for a, a human until like what, maybe like maybe preschool, kindergarten. Yeah. That's when you really start to get your first wits about your mm-hmm. memory and your mm-hmm. mind. Um, so I, I remember a good part. Uh, I remember some things about preschool and, and I have some, I have some like traumatic memories of even before preschool age, like probably like three years old. Uh, and I think about it a lot. And, and obviously we, we can get to most of these details now. And I understand that like, it might sound like I'm, I'm just cascading over a lot of things so we can come back to it. But like point being, um, I have a kid now and he mm-hmm. just turned two and I, there are so many things that I still have in my memory that are like traumatic memories from being, like I said, maybe even three years old, like very, very small that I remember how I felt then. And I have that memory imprinted in me. And I realized that like, I didn't want to feel that way. And so now in the, the challenge of being a parent, you know, and mm-hmm. raising a small mm-hmm. child, there are developmental curves for him now that I'm like, I have those terrible memories. And I recognize that this is an opportunity for me right now to not do that same thing to him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Isn't so that exciting though? It's super exciting. It's super exciting. I, that's what I get excited about. Like, yeah. we're not going to replay it. No, not if it's up to me. You yeah, know? Exactly. And I'm at least going to give it hell trying not to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, we're still going to half screw them up, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's going to be less than how our parents. Oh my <laughs> yeah, and that's gosh. the way I look at it. Yeah, it's going to be a different tier <laughs> yeah, of screwed yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that opportunity is some of the most, like, to me, it was so refreshing because I just remember thinking, God, I would never, like, like, as I, when I, early teenage, I'm just like, I would just not do it this way. Absolutely. And I'm thinking, like, man, when I get a shot at this, mm-hmm. I'm just going to do it so different. Yeah. And so for you, that's got to be. Yeah. really refreshing Tyler yeah absolutely yeah it's, it's definitely refreshing and and I'm talking like even it would be so easy um like just for instance this is one example this just happened to me last night leading up to the early hours of this morning you get woken up in the middle of the night it's easy to be half half asleep half awake and you're grumpy and it's easy to be like you know start raising your voice be like why is this going on just shut up go back to sleep whatever because my, my little guy still sleeps in bed with us yeah um, and you know, the, the mothers get worn down. God bless the mothers that, that just give it day in and day out. And <laughs> it sounds like energy. we have the same night right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet we did. And, um, you know, and, and it's, it, it's so exciting for me to just, just say to her like, Hey, I've got this under control. Don't even worry about it. If you want to go sleep in the living room, if you want me to take him out of here, this is super important to me. So yeah. like even in the middle of the night, even in a half awake, half asleep state, I can, I have that about me. And I, I'm, I'm so happy that, that I can remember that and calm myself down and self-regulate and try to even offer that change of momentum in, in, in an example that would be so easy to just, you know, fly off the handle or not handle it that way. Do you feel, um, cause I've had this over time, like, I feel uh, genetic traits of my dad that peak up that I know are the things I don't want. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know, and I, and sometimes I, I can't change it, but most of the time I can catch it and go, Mm -hmm. wait, this is like, he he would do it this way. And because that's what feels natural to do because that's who we're bred by. But then you go, wait a second. No, I'm going to fight against that and do it this way. Do you feel things like that? Every day. Yeah. I wondered every single day. And, uh, I never, I, I never really had a time to where I felt like I was addicted to something that was a, a super vice that I, that would be super easy to, to go down a slippery slope mm-hmm. and lose control over it. But I feel, I feel those tendencies, you know, I, I feel the tendencies and I feel that lineage and that genetic, those genetic traits that would be very natural, like you said, but very easy for me to just fall into and be like, well, it's just there. I can't help it, you know, and be violent, be mm-hmm. belligerent, be irresponsible, be addicted to things that are not great to be addicted to, um, and then lead the life that that will take you down every day. And you've I, already seen how that played out. One thousand percent, one thousand percent. And, you know, it's still it still doesn't stop. It, it puts out a ripple effect that will almost never stop. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Uh, but yeah, so to answer that question, the the answer is yeah, and uh, I feel it every day. But I try to, I try to put that and leverage that in and in, 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 into things that I can cultivate. Maybe say in business, um, in healthy habits, mm-hmm. um, something like if it's personal fitness, whatever it is. Um, 
that are going to serve me much better. You know what I mean? And, and I look at it as ways not only to, to remember things about like, hey, I, I recognize from my past that this in front of me now in the present is an opportunity um, to apply what I thought I would do differently back then. Um, did that yeah. awareness, did that awareness like come to you right away? Like re- the ability to like reframe the situation like that, does that come naturally to you somewhat or is that something that you got better at as you went along? The opportunity, w- I recognized, I should say, I recognized that the opportunity to be able to do that was there really early on. Um, but that's I unusual, I feel like, for yeah, most people. Yeah, and but I definitely had to get better at it and have gotten better at that over the years just with practice and remembering and applying and choosing to um, choosing to not to not opt for something uh, mm-hmm. that, that would be just doing the same thing. And I think the reason why, to, to your question, is – the reason why I was able to recognize that the opportunity um, to make a change and to see that there's something here that I don't want to do and, and be aware of that, the self-awareness aspect, the reason that was there and so prevalent for me, I think, is because if I didn't pay attention to everything and if I didn't listen for every sound that was going on and watch for every move that was made and the change in a person's facial expression, it was because that was danger to me. You know what I mean? And like I said, I'm happy to answer any questions mm-hmm. you guys have and paint mm-hmm. a better picture for the audience or even for you guys. Um, but just the general background as to why that was is because, um, like I said, with the family life, there was there was no structure. There was a lot of instability. Um, there's a history of so many, so many not great things, not just with my father, not just with my mother, but like even the generations that came before them. Mm. Um, so it was all there around a history me. of like addiction, abuse, all oh, so like bad. multiple generations. So bad. And you know, what's crazy, Corey is, that, um, I was just, I, I try to visit with the grandparents that are still around and that mm-hmm. I grew up knowing. Um, and I'm still learning more mm. about things because, you know, they're, they're not yeah. going to tell you certain things when you're a kid. And now that you're an adult, you can share a little bit more. But, you know, it's 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 wild, man. Probably even two weeks ago, my my mom's mom just shared something with me. And she told me she's never shared it with another soul ever mm. before, you know. And so I'm still learning things um, even at this stage. Uh, and and there's still, you know, some of those some of the subject matter that, that my grandma was sharing with me just a couple weeks ago. Um, super traumatic and so that's the first time she's expressed that and let that off of her chest you know what I mean and she's yeah and she's you know mid 60s pushing 70 at this point because she had my mother super young and then my mother had me young and um, so anyway yeah yeah there's a super heavy long (coughs) history of um, you know mental battles emotional battles keeping things in traumatic events that were forced upon uh, people from both sides of my family, from multiple generations. Um, but once again, an opportunity to, to completely shift the thing the entire other direction. Yeah, absolutely. Which, I absolutely. mean, if that doesn't get you fired up every day to get out of bed, bro. Yeah. I mean, not just from a business standpoint, but from a relationship and family standpoint. Yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. As yeah. you, like, developed and you grew up, you got to <laughs> high school and stuff. So we keep talking about, like, instability and not having structure or stuff like that. When did that start entering the picture or did you ever have a role model or, or someone that you could rely on? Like, when did that even start to begin? Because now you, you're like the king of, you know, structure and systems and shit like that. So that's like, how did that transition start? Well, thank you for saying that. And those are, those are things that I'm still working on, um, at this point. But I, I think where like step one really started was, When I moved back to Roseville from like Ashley or Delaware, right in between there, um, I was, I was seven and I was, it was the summer between first and second grade for me. And, um, like I said, the town was so small and I didn't, I didn't have a whole bunch of supervision, but I still knew right from wrong, um, because I was able to identify it. Not because not, not so much because of of my raising, but, um, I, it's not like I was running the streets because I was like looking for trouble at the age of seven. I was just out running because I was like, well, let me just see what this place is about. And I just want to go be outside and run around. So anyway, um, with me doing that, I, I was at a pop machine at a, at a little empty fire station there in town. And this other kid comes up and was trying to buy a pop at the pop machine too. Well, he, uh, he's, he was four years older than me. So he must've been 11 at the time. And uh, his name is Chase. And from that day on, he was my best friend. And Chase had two older brothers. So he was the youngest. 
but even to me, he was four years older than me. Yeah. So then he got a brother that's older than him, and then his older brother's got an older brother. And so I just I started hanging out with him. I'm like, I'm gonna hang out with this dude. It's the first person I met in town. It's the first friend I made. <laughs> that's amazing. He, that's awesome. He's been one of my best. You're friends. You're my best friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout out Chase. Yeah. And so yeah, shout out. you know, yeah, shout out Chase, man. Um, and then he's been one of my best friends from from then on. It's been over 20 years, which is crazy to say. But then, so starting from there, my point being, um, I was always there. And then when I started playing Biddy League football, his dad was my coach for all, you know, six years. And so his friends and his brother's friends became my friends, or so I thought. So yeah. even if they were running around and they were the ones playing at the park, I was just watching. And when it came to sports, like, you know, we were always playing basketball at the park. They would stuff the shit out of me. But it got better because I was like, I'm playing with dudes that are taller than me, much bigger than me because I was yeah. a little kid. And uh, so from that point, it's like I had to pay attention to what they were doing. And then I would naturally be like – because I, w I was already, you know, self-aware enough to look for things because I felt like I was in danger as a little kid, that would translate to them and I would watch. And so if I would see one of them got hurt in sports or if one of them wrecked their car or they got in trouble in school or they had a bad breakup with their girlfriend, I would watch and I would say, what went wrong there? And I would ask them and I would say, what, what happened? Why, why did you get hurt? Why did you wreck your car? Why did your friend get in trouble? Why did he do these things he shouldn't do? Or what did you do wrong in your, with your girlfriend? So I can learn from that and so I can avoid that when I get up there. So you've always mm. been a question asker. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I like it. And you know what's crazy is like maybe, maybe part of it is like just the personality and natural instinct I was born with. And, but maybe most of it was so heavily handed from trying to avoid danger. So was, that, that's what I thought as a kid. Um, because my, the, I think the main motivation for me asking all those questions and trying to learn all those things and constantly watching is because I wanted to avoid it. I was yeah. like, I need to it's avoid like, this at yeah. all costs. You, you know like developed I mean? it out of necessity almost. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a great trait now, though, Tyler. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, how you learn. It's amazing. Absolutely, Trevon. Um, I think we should go back to like so, like just like how we got to like max effort and everything in the first mm -hmm. place. So like yeah. uh, high school, and then you go to college. Like where do you go to college at? What do you major in? And then like what is your job, like engineering job, leading up to even going the max effort? Yeah. So me. Um, so c to answer your question and to, to try to answer the the second half of Danny's question. Um, so I. I had some structure about me, even in high school, to, to get to the college part. Um, but, you know, even though those guys were all my friends that I just described, they were all four years ahead of me. So even though they were my friends, I didn't have them in school. And mm -hmm. when I needed them or thought that mm -hmm. I needed them in school for actual guidance in the school building or in the system or, or help from people that would bully me and shit, um, they, they were always ahead of me. So they were in eighth grade when I was in fourth grade. And, the, and so for us in that school system, fourth grade was a different building. That mm -hmm. was the end of elementary school. And then fifth through eighth was a different building. That was got a middle it. school. So then the next year when I got into the middle school, they were in high school. They already gone. And then when <laughs> I was in eighth grade about to go to high school, they were in college. You know what I mean? Um, so that I always had it, but it was always like one degree away from me from fully having that next level of structure. Sure. Um, so I would say it really, really started when I got out of high school because like we were talking about on the, on the Boomcast the other day, once you get out of school, um, and for me, it wasn't the next stage of college, wasn't sports or anything. So that, uh, you know, in high school, I was like, I knew I had to be there at this time every day. It lasted until this time every day, Monday through Friday. I had sports. At the end of high school, it was like there was nothing. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left, you know, and if I did have friends in high school, they were some of them were going out of state for college. Some of them was going and living on a main campus somewhere. I, I had nothing. So to, to answer your question, um, I, I soon realized I was like, man, I got I got nothing right now. Um, and and I'm happy to answer any of like the ancillary family stuff that was happening in the background of that time of getting out of high school and me like really not knowing what to do. So I was like, no one else is going to do it for me. I got to, whatever I want to do, whatever I want to make, whatever I want to be, whatever I want to learn, I have to create it myself mm -hmm. or have to create the start for myself. I don't think that's a bad, like maybe getting to that point's a bad feeling because you're like, this fucking sucks. It's hard. But when you only have to rely on you and you have to choose it, mm -hmm. I knew like, mm -hmm. okay, this is, I, I just was like, this is on me. Absolutely. So at the end of the day, I'm going to get up and get down, and I know it's on me. Yeah. I'm not waiting on anybody else to fucking do it for me, bro. Yeah, absolutely. And I think once you take ownership like that, for real, it can change. It, that's how you change stuff. That's how you change stuff. And it does get easier, like you said, the point you just made about 
um, when you when you can leverage that and you know that it's all on you and you you accept that and yeah, you start to take the initiative it. with it, um, it does make a certain part of it easier. Because when you start to create that, it doesn't it didn't matter like if I was working two three jobs and I, I knew like you know I, I could wake up at three a.m. and I, I didn't have to worry about like man I gotta I'm gonna wake somebody else up or I got I gotta depend on someone else to take me. It's like no I'm I'm getting myself up at three. I'm able to drive myself where I need to go. I'm going to work until this time, you know, and then, you, you know what I mean? I didn't have to depend on anybody else. I didn't have to depend on a ride from nobody else. I didn't have to depend on anybody else to, like, to get me going. So accepting that part made it made it easier yeah. to then begin that momentum on some of the things that I was chasing down. Um, but so getting out of high school, um, I, I knew that I was going to start college because there were – there were a certain number, like if you weren't going to go to the military and if you weren't going to go work a particular job without education past high school, um, and if you knew you were committed to doing something, then with me crossing those other things off the list, I was like, well, I'm going to go to college, you know, because I'm going to learn more. I wanted to expand my education because at the time I thought this is the only way I'm going to I'm going to build that next step of my life and create something for myself. Were you a good student? When I wanted to be 4.0. When I yeah, when I wanted to be yeah, <coughs> when I when Damn. I wanted to be, yeah. uh, but to be honest with you guys, like I, I was embarrassed about it a lot throughout school. Like I excelled at school um, through like elementary school, junior high. When I got to high school, shit started getting really bad and a lot more dangerous for me. Um, and you know, other social pressures creep in when you get to high school because, mind you, I just – in eighth grade and then freshman year, I just started blending with so many other kids mm -hmm. that I was the best athlete coming out of a lot of the sports at Roseville because we were a small school. It wasn't, it wasn't hard to do that. I was the best athlete coming out of Roseville. And then all those other kids knew, well, y'all are those smelly Roseville kids coming in. They, they looked at us like we were, we were something totally else, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They were so fucking mean to us. And there were a couple kids that were, like, a little bit more quirky that would – just they didn't care about like animosity and all that but dude i'm telling you like at the age of 13 i tried to play babe ruth baseball i was the only one to go from roseville crooksville because they had their mm -hmm. own team to go play at father because i was like well i'm about to go blend in with these kids in eighth grade next year let me just go play baseball with them there was like one kid that it, that that so-called accepted me or wasn't an asshole to me you know what i mean and tried to bully me and i'm like dude i'm just playing baseball you know what i mean <laughs> um so what, what was the first part of your question again? Sorry. <laughs> uh, Trey was about going, to, going to college, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, that um, – getting to that point, I was like, well, I, I know that I'm going to go to college because I don't want to go work on a pipeline. I don't want to go drive truck. I don't want to do all this stuff, not because I turned my nose up to it. Uh, because, dude, I, I worked, I worked like weird, obscure, nasty jobs that I. Oh, okay. Because we were talking about, uh, we were talking about school and the GPA. So when I wanted okay. to be, but once I got to high school, it was, it was, it was. <laughs> Give us a what? job now. Come on. <laughs> so wait. So like, how, how old were you? I guess whenever, um, you know, shit must have really hit the fan because I, I imagine with anyone who has like some sort of like issue like this family rise or relationship wise mm -hmm. there's always a defi definitive moment mm -hmm. where shit really goes down yeah and you're like N it, this is it now yeah how old how old were you a freshman were you a sophomore like how old was that so like i said i have memories really bad memories imprinted in me that will never leave me as early as i mean dude i'm telling you i had to have been three that that were violent like i remember i remember watching some crazy shit going down and me hiding um I was living in a trailer and I think my parents were trying to make shit work out. And, uh, um, I, you know, I just remember hiding because there was as if no one was going to find me in this tiny ass trailer. But I, I was like, remember thinking to myself, I just have to hide because I thought my dad was going to kill me. You know what I mean? And then I, I remember, so like I said, we moved back to Roseville when I was seven. So I couldn't have been much older than maybe eight. Uh, maybe even that first year, like maybe, maybe I was still seven. But anyway, um, there was this one night, I think it was, it must have, it, it still could have been a school night, I don't know. But anyway, um, I remember, so just for a little bit of context here, when I'm saying these things, my, 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 my father struggled with addiction of, of many sorts. It wasn't, it, w it was a lot of alcohol, but it wasn't just alcohol, it was hard, hard drugs. Um, and so, very obviously, he must have been intoxicated, but I remember hearing one night, as, like I said, maybe seven, eight, I don't know. Um, I remember, I heard this loud crash and 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 i quickly thought 
well, it must have been a coffee table going through the TV. Y'all remember those old TVs, like big box TVs, and oh, it had yeah. a curved front, and it was mm-hmm. like a glass oh, yeah. front? I heard him pick up a, a coffee table and throw it through the TV, and I heard that glass bust, and the TV, like, basically explode in my mind. And then and that caught my attention because I was upstairs. It was a small house, two-story house. I was upstairs. My mom and dad were downstairs. And I remember hearing him say, um, how much do you guys want me to say and how much do you Dude, want me to not say? Do whatever you want, you want, Yeah, it's up to you, buddy. Um, I, just, I just remember him hearing, hearing him say, I'll fucking kill you to my mother, and then I'm going to go upstairs, and I'll fucking kill him too. And then he was, and then I think he said something about probably – about, about taking about taking himself also um so i mean those things are there as like a mile marker or like an integer point super early those are as you know as very young and i remember those things at a very young age and once you hear some shit like that and you know that's even a thought you're thinking Bro. you can never come back from no that. and, and I, I know i even then i knew at that time i could recognize disparity in in no matter who you are every race color and creed every part of the world disparity and, but i and i recognized how lucky i was even at at the age of seven that you know living in america at the time that we do there's so much more abundance so much more opportunity i could recognize then that i wasn't i i didn't have the worst situation in the world yeah. so I, I had hope and I, and i had like um gratitude for that even at that age but i also was I had the self-awareness at that time not just to understand that that was a serious thing going on at that time um and to recognize the severity of it and the danger behind that but i also thought to myself i'm like how many other fucking seven-year-olds or how many other people in my community are hearing this right now? Mm. And how many people know how to navigate this? You know what I mean? I, I had that self-awareness at that age. And it wasn't like a, how many people are going through what I'm going through, beat my chest thing. But I was like, how many other people are going through this? Uh, yeah. And I was I was embarrassed, you know, for the longest time I was so embarrassed because Roseville's such a poor town. I was poor as shit. Everybody, all, all of our, like that was a, almost a thing that banded us together in Roseville um, and why I love that community so much is because not a single one of us had anything. Like even the all the kids ahead of us, like it didn't matter if you were like, the, it wasn't, there was no situation where you were like, oh, so-and-so's brother who's in eighth grade and we're in second grade, their family has this money. Like there was no one there. If you lived in Roseville, it was because y'all were there because that's where you Everybody were Everybody was be. on the same social that's right. like. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so, but then when we, when we got to Fadlo and when I got to eighth grade in high school, there was some more families that like this person had a law firm, this person had insurance, that person's family had a construction business. And there were some people that would drive, you know, some people had a BMW. I'm like, y'all just got your license. You got a BMW. So So I started seeing some other stuff out there. Yeah. And so that just added on to, I was like, man, I'm embarrassed. I, I, I thought I had to hide everything about, about my home situation, about the lack of resources, um. Yeah. So that added to it. So but then I felt embarrassed about a lot of that stuff too. Yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah, normal, same. dude. So to to answer your question, so even from there, dude, I remember like it, it's crazy because I could go on and on. I've got all these stories that would really, really paint context and paint a picture for everybody. Um, but well, I uh, think that first one painted I, the, I think, just yeah. enough for everybody, Tyler. Yeah. So. Maybe I'll give you two more. Maybe no, I'll give please. you two more just yeah. to show that sequence yeah. of what happened leading up to. Because I'm a problem. I'm getting your point. Trey. <laughs> He's but, getting but, to your question, Trayvon. But bro, th- these are all things that like I I had to try to navigate and figure out, and had happened that I didn't ask for to happen. Just just getting there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember at the age of twelve, uh, my parents were no longer together, but I didn't. I didn't like it was. I I, didn't, I couldn't choose where to live at the age of twelve. I was just like trying to make it work and trying to have friends and go back to school and and all that but I remember I remember laying there one night and I was living with my dad some of the time living with my grandma some of the time and I I would stay with Chase and his family which were in Roseville not not far from me as much as I could but I remember one night I was I was living with my dad at my grandma's old house and he wasn't there often but I was like responsible enough and 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 to where I could stay home by myself but anyway I, I was asleep and it had to have been, I don't know, it had to have been super late. It was way dark outside, probably like midnight. And he came back home and very, very much intoxicated. And and he was on the phone talking about some talking about some crazy shit. Like he was on the phone talking to some some chick he, he was probably pimping with. And then he, and then, I, but but right before he got home this night, I, I got a call. We, we got a call to the phone. And this is landlines back then. And this dude left a message on the answering machine. And it, I knew it was one of my dad's buddies. 
but what I didn't know at the time leading up to that message that I heard um, was this dude was a drug dealer. And, and I heard him leave a message talking about people was coming after him, was talking about they, they now know that my dad's holding some stuff. And, uh, and then my dad came home shortly after that, but he didn't see the message on the answer machine because he was, he was all hopped up. And then he, uh, and then he walked up and like got right in my face to, just to see if I was asleep. And he was on the phone. He's like, yeah, he's still asleep. We're good. But like, I didn't have a bedroom. I didn't have a bed. I was in the living room on the couch right next to the front door. I'm like, but so I'm thinking at 12 years old, I'm like, this motherfucker thinks I can't hear him being loud as yeah. shit walking in and he's doing all this shit. And I'm like, I know what's going on. And he don't even know I heard this message. And so anyway, there was some crazy shit that happened that night. Well, anyway, the very next day, the dude that called and left that message, uh, he got murdered and, no shit. and he lived like not far from us. And so, so it went down, went down, bro, went night. down, went down. But so I'm learning this and I'm like very quickly realizing I'm like, there's, there's people that's going to be pulling up and I'm here and I ain't got nowhere else to go. And I like, I recognize that I was in the middle of all that shit, mm -hmm. 12 <laughs> years old. You know what I mean? I, and I'm like, what, what the fuck else do I do? But I, dude, I was, I, I didn't know what to do. I felt shame. I felt embarrassment. I felt confusion. I felt frustration. I didn't know what to do. I, I was I was too embarrassed. Well, because you're a minor, there, yeah. what can you do? I don't know, man. What did you I, do? I, yeah. Well, I felt like Survive. I was just, yeah, man. One day at a time. Yeah. I just I felt did like you I stay there. Did you ever reach out to like Chase? Like, was there any ever, well, ever anyone who may you may have never reached out, but they were they knew the situation. They were trying to help you. Like, did you ever get that? Nobody ever knew the severity of it. I think I think my dad's mom. I think his mom knew that there was a problem. I know she knew there was a problem because she, she used to let him drink before, when he was a teenager, like before I was even born, but she was an enabler for all of that because she didn't want to lose him. And that, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a whole nother story as to why it, she had that issue and why she didn't want to lose him because, um, you know, she had so much trauma. Uh, it's just, it's just wild, man. Um, so anyway, that, that was one. And then I'll, I'll just give you like one, one more, like one and a half. So like in, in high school, I wasn't old enough to drive, but I was in high school. So I must've been 15. I could have been just turning 16. Cause I didn't get, I didn't get my license or car right away. As soon as I turned 16. So I could have been right about there, but I got home from school one day and I saw my dad and this other dude in the house, um, snorting Coke. And it was right when I walked in the door and they, I, very quickly realized what they were doing and then they both looked at me and then they looked at each other and they both looked back at me and his dude which i knew was violent i knew was also a drug dealer i knew was also a user because i grew up with his kids in roseville um and he had this dude that i'm talking about had been in and out of prison yeah, he he had died before and they brought him back to life like i knew like all he of was a real stuff. one he was a real one like and he was a in big the streets <laughs> dude big dude on juice like he was huge. Mm -hmm. I was scared as shit. And uh, I walked in, and they obviously knew that I saw that, and they didn't care that I saw them do that. They were just more concerned with that, like, I wasn't going to go and tell somebody. I'm like, motherfucker, who am I going to go and tell at this point? Like, who, who else? You, and, and I'm like, you, both of you guys live your life with no repercussions. You, you, never get in, you never get in definitive trouble to where, like, it fully stops you from living this way. So, but you know so anyway they they both like cornered me and and basically told me like you you didn't see any of this you're not going to tell anybody about this um and so just just those recurring situations mm -hmm. um you know and then i don't know i was probably i maybe even like still 16 i could have been 17 at this point i found my dad uh he had overdosed and, and i knew i knew that that was the case like right away and hit my dad has a brother, a younger brother. Uh, so my uncle is still significantly older than me. Um, you know, and, and I was, I remember this night specifically because I was, I was about to go back home. I, I think I must've had a baseball game or something because I was getting home when it was dark outside. It wasn't like right after school. And so I had gone to school, must've had went and gone and had a baseball game. And then, you know, maybe it was like trying to hang out with my teammates or something. And so that kept me out of the house for a long time. Well, I went to go home and my uncle must have known that I wasn't home yet because, and he must have known the timing. Like he was probably looking at the time, looking at his phone, like, 
Tyler's baseball game is probably over yet. He tried to call me and was like, basically, don't go home. Don't go home. He was like, you don't. I, 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 I can't tell you anything. Just please listen to me. Don't go home. And because I think he was probably trying to get a hold of my dad. He knew my dad wasn't answering. And my dad must have told him some shit. And he must have just assumed that he yeah. was, he might have been dead. And so my uncle was trying to, not, trying to get me to not go home because he was like, I don't want Tyler to see that. Well, I went home, and I found him there, and I saw that he was overdosed. And, I, like, I knew that was the situation. I saw he had shit all over him. I saw, like, uh, I saw paraphernalia, like um, a tourniquet. I saw needles. I saw hot spoons. Uh, <laughs> this is funny. My, my buddies and I still joke about it because if I can't joke about it, it's just going to keep me fucked up. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have no spoons in the house because Dad was – he, he was using them all. They were all burnt up from, you know, Jeez, free basin. Man. And uh, But so – uh, he was he overdosed on on uh, speedball. Yeah, he was he Damn. was doing coke, shooting up shit. And um, my my uncle, I I beat I beat everybody else to the house, but my uncle got there. And here here's what's crazy. Here's here's what's crazy is like there's been so much crazy shit like that that like I, I have some amount of have, amount of respect for my dad and maybe just like our our genetic lineage. Because he he is impe- in impenetrable at at some point because he he very clearly was there. I felt him and he he wasn't cold cold, but I felt no pulse. I felt no pulse that night. And after just sitting there spending some time, I it all happened so fast. I was I was fucked up from it. I didn't even start doing CPR or anything. Something happened, and he came back to life. He just woke up. He woke up. He woke Shut up. Shut the fuck I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <clears throat> no shit. I swear to Jesus. So you get home. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you get home. He's out. He's out, though. No pulse. How long a time is this? I have no idea. But then it all, all of happened a sudden. so much. And he was up, and it was like, you know, it was real slow. And I could tell he was still very clearly fucked up because you got all that shit going in your body. Yeah. And who knows, like, how instant it could have been, like, when he sure. did all that. It could have took him out very quickly. It could have gotten the system, ran Jolted his course for a back. little bit. Who knows? So he, like, came to in your life. He came to, but he didn't even recognize me. You know what I mean? He didn't know He didn't know anybody else was there. He just got up, started pacing the house. You know, was kind of leaning on some shit to get his balance and everything. So it's not like he was up and running like a track star, but, like, he was up. Wait, I felt how I much felt the body no can pulse. fucking bro. take, bro. Were bro. other people there when he woke up, or was it just you? It was just me. And then, uh, so my my uncle got there and like witnessed that he was very clearly intoxicated, but he didn't even know everything I had just seen. You know what I mean? And and of course, my my uncle's got a totally different personality than my dad, than me. So he was like trying to take the approach to be like he was being tough love. He's like, "You fucking idiot! You got to change your life. You're gonna kill yourself." I'm like, he can't even hear you right now, man. Yeah, yeah, he you're going to say this, and he's going to see a threat, and he ain't going to know it's you, and he's going to start getting violent. You know what I mean? So that that was that was some shit, you know. And I mean, I've had other instances where I accidentally crossed paths with my dad, and he was all hopped up on shit, didn't know it was me. I see him pacing back and forth. He'll run back this way. He'll come back out. Forget that he even just saw a human, let alone it was me. But he didn't know it, and he would leave the room, come back. And then forget that someone was there. Like I said, I've had my dad pull a gun on me before, multiple times before, because he didn't, like, he would lock everything up. He spray painted black all over the windows, put, like, he, he was getting super paranoid mm. at the height of all this because he owed people money. People owed him money. He thought people was going to kill him. Um, so when I showed up before, I was like, I got my baseball glove in there. I got school books in there, like, and I was knocked on the front door because I'm locked out of my own my own place. And I, I mean, I ain't got nowhere else to go. Like, I was living with my friends most of the time, but like, I wanted a relationship with my dad. Of course, you know what I mean. Everybody Even in does. the midst of all that, so I was like fighting for that. Um, so that that kind of might answer somebody's question about like, why would you still stay around? It's complicated, but um, anyway. And he, I remember him opening the front door and having a gun right there pointing right at my face because he didn't know who it was you know what i mean um and he lived every day of his life messed up on something for for the longest period of time um so i, I would have stuff like that happen you know um I, I know that he i know that my dad and his cousin who uh had had much more of a track record in prison than than what my dad did they were definitely involved in some stuff they um you know they claimed that they were in a gang for a while they were involved in in some 
and 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 you know some of the most the the worst parts of any of that you can imagine um and and they knew that I had witnessed some things like like them being involved in people dying and um and I just remember them you know quasi threatening me that you 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 didn't see any of this you're not going to tell anybody about this you know what I mean? The Roundtable Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineer tools for your family jewels. Manscaped re- recently launched the Ultimate Men's Hygiene Bundle, the Performance Package. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off in free worldwide shipping with the code... Small arms with a Z S M A L L A R M Z manscaped.com. That's right. And you know, listen here, I got to tell you why I love manscaped. Tell me, Cole. I think, uh, you know, all like myself personally, the listeners, you know, you've probably used a razor that, you know, might not have been that good. And you might nick yourself. I I know I have, but listen, let me tell you the performance package 4.0 is here and it is game changing. And, you know, inside this package, you'll find the lawn, the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, dog, dog, the weed, the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, dog, dog. the crop preserver ball deodorant, dog. dog, the crop retriever toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold your goodies, dog. dog. And now, listen, I'm just going to say this might be the best ball trimmer I've ever used. Uh, Damn. Danny. What, what's your thoughts? You know what else sucks? Right? What? Whoa, whoa. Is, is when you're in the bathroom and, you know, you did your business and yeah. then there's a mess on the floor. Oh, right? it's the worst. So, yeah, th- this this bad boy is waterproof. So oh. Nice. Nice. Easy clean up. Nice. Yeah, so, like, yeah, so Linda will have to like, clean it up after you, right? Facts. Yeah, right. Yeah. True on. I'm personally a little sweaty down there. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so Trey like, speed. Yeah, so this crop reviver here. This is gonna save my life. Say goodbye yeah, to the right. duck butter. Because when we when we're working out at four AM in the morning, yes. it gets rough sometimes. Yeah. So it doesn't say bad. anywhere on the uh, don't say list that it does, it's gonna save your life. So that's good. Yeah. yeah that's that's great. Great. That's great. That's a great testimonial. <laughs> if yeah. you do manscape and you put in the code small arms at manscape.com with a Z arms. Shout you out. fucking it might save your life. Yeah, that's right. You're gonna get twenty percent off and free shipping if you if you use the code Small Arms, all caps with the Z. You like our listeners know know how it works. Uh, yeah, spell it out again. Here's it. Uh, it's S M A L L A R M Z. As in Zaddy. As in Zaddy Daddy. <laughs> and listen, here's the deal. If y'all want us to get put on, go buy Manscaped today, and they're gonna put us on. Yeah, that's yeah. it. No sweaty balls anymore. We know how bad that yeah. is. Yeah, that's right. All right, I guess, yeah, all right. Let's, let's go, go back to the show. Let's go to the show. I mean? So, like during this time, like uh, so, those situations is those are the things that kept happening, and I'm like, I can't fucking do this anymore. So you got that during that time. Who were like cause th- again? This is probably in the beginning of social media. So you're there's yeah. people. Who, yeah. who, if it was maybe a coach or someone local. You know, even Corey, like who are the guys that you were looking to while all this is going on, like as keeping that inspiration in front of you? Like I just like, eventually I'm going to get out of this. Yeah. Who are you looking at? Yeah. Uh, I didn't really get social media or nothing until. Until maybe I was like sophomore, junior in high school. So it was a little bit later. Um, but but I love sports. Like I, I always I always played sports and uh, and made that work. Like I would just get a ride with so and so or get a ride from their older brother or you know, some of the upperclassmen on the baseball team, like I would just ride to them. So I always kept playing sports. Well, and you're good at sports too, which probably helped Tyler because those yeah. older guys would be like, we need this young yeah. dude in here. You got some game too. Yeah, because luckily enough, like I was, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I'm probably like six one. I was at least six foot. I grew to six foot during my freshman year before baseball season. Mm. Um, so I was tall. I was lanky. I pitched on the varsity team as a freshman. I didn't yeah. end up lettering that year, but I would, I would, relief pitch so that was fun you know and i had those opportunities as early as my freshman year that's big um but really it was just uh it it was it was chasing all of his friends which are now my lifelong friends and have been um so but i i ain't gonna lie like like i said i knew right from wrong because of watching all that stuff but like when i was in eighth grade and they were and you know they were seniors in high school and they had older brothers that were in college i would go to colleges and i would go to college parties with them when i was Mm. 13 you know what i mean um, and I, cause I just, that's what they were doing. And I was like, I'm with y'all. Like what yeah, you're doing. These are your doing. homies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so those guys, those guys were always 
dude, if I didn't have those guys growing up and if I didn't meet Chase and become friends with him that, that day when I was seven, I have no idea what my life would have turned out like, to be honest with you. I don't know. Well, be- Cole keeps asking these questions because it takes at least some influence to say, wait, there is a different way. Because I'm yeah. telling you what, Tyler, I, back where we're from too, I see a lot of situations that are similar like yeah. you, and I think yeah. this kid's got no shot. No. Because if there ain't somebody – that is a friend or a family member that can recognize it or show them a different way. You never know a different way. Yeah. Cause you never leave that street, that town or that situation yeah. that becomes normal. Cause it was your normal bro. For sure. For sure. And, and then I, and I, and I know situations like that. And I, and I, it, it, it when I go down, downtown Newark, bro, it kills me. Cause I'm thinking like these yeah. kids don't have a fucking shot, bro. Unless somebody intervenes a little bit, yeah, which is why I wanted to donate to the Boys and Girls Club because absolutely that those type of situations are sometimes their only lifeline. That's mm-hmm. it, man. That's it, man. And as much as like, as much as I hated school for a long time for many years because you know, um, it, it was it was weird. Like I I had older friends, uh, like like those guys, but they were never there in the same school building. So it's like I couldn't I couldn't even get that reputation. Be like, oh, he's got all these, and all these guys like him, and they're four or five years older than him. There must be something about him. We'll give him a little bit of respect because he's friends with these guys. Like, I never got, I never got any of that a- unless it was through sports, mm-hmm. and even that took time. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, but like all through school and everything, like I, I did, I didn't really fit into one crowd. You know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't cool enough and like athletic enough to be in some of these like jock clicks and everything, but I wasn't artsy enough to be with some of the the quirky kids that didn't play sports, but was super into art. I would like, I was just in the, I was look, I was in the middle looking at all these like clicks and groups and shit. And like, I had friends and I I could blend in and go and and communicate with any number of them. But if they decided that day that I wasn't cool enough and, and they felt like bullying somebody, they would try to take that shit out on me. You know what I mean? I never like, I never had one definitive click through any of my school years because all my friends were onward and, and out of there. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, you could rely on one person this entire story, Tyler, and it's pretty much you. Yeah. Which I know yeah. ultimately is how life is anyway, but that's not how it's supposed to be. No, no. <laughs> I mean, you know it what was, I mean? There's the support was – yeah. Friends, family, there just was none, essentially. There w- there was none, you know. And even when it came to sports, like, unless we were at a park somewhere on a weekend or on a summer, I couldn't even play sports, like, with my friends that were older. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I could play basketball with them on a, on a weekend, summer day at the park. But, like, even from there, I had to try to – I had to try to create that. And then when I get to, to, to answer the question about, about, like, the structure and the sports and everything, even when I got into high school – um, by that time, more and more Roseville kids were falling off. Or if they did commit to going to follow, they ended up going to a different school. And so they, I was one of maybe like three kids from Roseville that maintained playing sports all throughout. So like I was constantly trying to earn the respect of the rest of those those Philo kids that had played together from day one mm-hmm. and didn't yeah. want to give up their spot. And then when there's this fucking 14-year-old, 15-year-old freshman kid coming in and he's relief pitching and there's a junior or there's a senior – on the varsity baseball team and I'm getting a step on the mound before them, they're, you know, they're, they're assholes to me and they don't like me. You know what I mean? Um, so like that was even a struggle. So there was like never, I was always looking for that. I'm like, man, one of these days I'm going to be in the in crowd with, with at least my own baseball team. You know what I mean? It was never there. It, yeah. it felt like it was never there. Um, so anyway, that was that was very long winded and a lot of a lot of context to try to, for me to try to provide just because there was so much stuff that went on even before I got into college. Um, so by the time I got to my senior year in high school, probably about halfway through, I was dating this girl, but she was a couple years younger than me. So I knew I was like, well. If we're going to keep being boyfriend and girlfriend when I get out of high school, she's still going to be in high school. I wanted to go I wanted to go play baseball because I was like, I'm best sports-wise at baseball. I want to keep playing. I don't, wanna, I don't necessarily want to go to the military. I don't want to go work pipeline or work this crazy shit like I just said. So I didn't really have any other plan. And I was like, I have to make something of myself, and it's probably going to be through more education. This is what I thought. 
to get me out of this situation, to get me out of this town, to get me out of a situation where I have zero resources. Every, most of my people around me that I grew up with, no resources. Um, I saw the way my grandma was still working, you know, into her 60s. And, and I was like, I just, there's no place around me, around here without more education or something to give me more credence that will allow me to be in this area and work and make something for myself. So I thought I have to go get education. So I wanted to do that and earn, earn a degree while still playing baseball. So I was like, well, um, I reached out myself to the OU and Athens baseball staff. And I and how I did it, actually, I reached out to some dudes that were on the baseball team at the time on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, I want to come play ball at OU. Tell me what it takes to come play ball at OU and get me in front of somebody. Like, let me come down there. Y'all didn't recruit me. Y'all didn't do anything. Like, I don't care what the situation is. Like, I don't care if I have to take loans and, and pay for my tuition for a first year or second year until I earn my spot on the team. That's what I wanted to do. Um, so I got an evaluation day set up down there basically to where they would they would see me and watch me hit, run, throw, do all that crazy shit um, to see if they would give me a shot just to at least yeah. like entertain the idea that eventually I could earn a spot on the baseball team. So um, I went and did that, and – it was, it was there. They're like, well, we're not going to tell you that we don't ever need more players, and we won't need uh, need you somewhere eventually. Did you do well that day, Tyler? Yeah, yeah, I did honestly better than I thought I would. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, <laughs> and so, um, so that that's what I was going to do at first. But I, you know, my mind's I, I'm I'm still pretty fucked up from most of this stuff at the time. So I didn't not not all of my decisions were 100 percent fundamentally sound. Mm -hmm. So I, thought, I don't even think all my decisions are all the way fundamentally sound. <laughs> Tyler, go. Yeah. I love how he said that just no, now, though. That's pinpointed Tyler. Go Especially ahead. at 18. Yeah, it's so good. Especially at 18. But yeah. then me at the time, I was like, well, there's no other structure in my life except for my girlfriend right now. So mm. she didn't want me to go to you, and she didn't want me to move away and go down <laughs> there. So I decided, I'm like, man, they ain't going to end up letting me on that team anyway. I probably ain't going to be good enough to play Division One baseball. Um, Were I those did, true? I don't think so. Yeah, that's, no. what, I, I could, that's what I thought you were I about don't think so. I think I could have played. And and also an important point, too, uh, I didn't start lifting weights until I was 18. So I was small. I was. You hadn't even tapped into your potential yet. No, no, no. He no, casually just said the other yeah. day, oh, yeah, we played that school. I hit two home runs in that game. <laughs> Like I didn't say anything, but I caught it. Like he, ca oh yeah, through eighty seven or, you know, yeah. it's like he casually yeah. drops some shit like that every now and again. <laughs> yeah, but I just, you know, I had other people. Like even some of the kids on my team would would they they were they were not nice, and they they would basically, they would basically tell me I ain't good enough. You know what I mean? I remember that because I was competing with them, and uh, and I I believed them sometimes. Other times I didn't. But um, those things would creep in, and I was like, man, they're probably right. I'm too small anyway. I, I didn't know anything about weightlifting. I didn't know anything about nutrition, the muscle, how that would translate to to sports skills. So I was like six six one, 150, hmm. 155. And, but even then, I was able to hit home runs. Uh, I could run. I could dive. I could field. I could pit, I popped out at 88 at six one, 155. Daddy got them hips. That's crazy. That's right, you know what I mean? <laughs> So I wish I could have got you under them bands, I kid. Know, I know, man. <laughs> I know, man. I, I regret that stuff a lot because I, I really do think I could have gone and, and I could have done more. But, you know, I just – I didn't have the full confidence about yeah. myself at that point with all well, this. Well, part of it is, too, like, w with the way you were brought up, it's not like somebody was, like, there, like, rooting you on. Bro. Never. And going – Never. I, but, you know what I mean? Like, that's the thing is, like, everybody's situation is so different. Yeah. And then how are you supposed to – I remember even just, like, trying to get ready for college. Like, yeah. filling out the forms myself, trying to figure it out, like – Dude, I had no direction. Wait till so I when you don't have any no too. direction, bro, yeah. you're like, what, what What? am I doing? <laughs> wait, wait till I talk about you the college forms. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, most of the time, like, I, you talk about people cheering you on. Like, I, you know, Chase and, and his friends, and which, which again, were, were my friends by this point, they would tell me, like, no, you could do it. Like, you're you're just as good as these people. Or you're, you're better than these people. You know what I mean? So, like, I would have a little bit of that, but, like, a lot of the time growing up in Little League and Babe Ruth in high school and, you know, any form of summer ball, uh, it was someone's dad that was – or even, like, dad and uncle that were the coaches on the team. So, like, I was – I felt like I was always competing 
just to earn the respect of somebody and to earn a spot and to, just to get them to like me. Like I, even in little leagues, like I thought people hated me. I was like, I, I, you know, and it was like residual shame and lack of structure from all the family stuff because I was like, man, I, I just, I'm, I ain't meant for none of this. Like I just, I just felt like I wasn't right. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had an asterisk or a stain on me that everyone could see no matter where I was. And so in my, my mind, basically what I'm saying is there, I didn't have that structure. I didn't have that background. I didn't have many people cheer me on and tell me and, and trying to give me structure and confidence and, and, cr and help me identify a path. And my back of my mind, I was like, I'm a fucking failure. I'm embarrassed by about everything. I can't tell anybody about what's going on at home. I, I don't have any structure. And my point of me saying like, you know, even when I got to school, like I never fit in with any of those crowds, even though that was the case, I was more excited to go to school because it got me out of the house. But then by the time I walked into school, I was like, man, I, nobody truly likes me anyway. You know what I mean? Um, so anyway, I, uh, I, I canceled that. I decided to go to a branch campus of OU in Zanesville because it's right there. And I was like, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna make it. They ain't gonna give me a fucking spot on the team anyway. I'm gonna go down there and pay to be there for two years, and then I'm gonna get to that point. They're gonna recruit some other kid that has a stable family that that got to play Legion ball and paid baseball leagues and has all that training and has all that coaching and shit. Because I started seeing that in like halfway through high school, I was like, oh shit, there's other leagues out there, and there's private coaches and there's private teams, and yeah. these people are doing this. I'm like, well, no wonder they're so good. You know what I mean? No wonder there's kids throwing 90 that I'm playing against in high school. And you got all these stuff that's untapped. This yeah. is just you out the box, out the trailer. And I, like. yeah, and I, <laughs> and I knew there was still there, but I was like, I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have that extra programming, that extra coaching, that extra guidance, those extra reps. I didn't know how to do it. Yep. You know what I mean? And and I knew I was like, well, I'm just gonna put in more work, but like, I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. Like, yeah. is me not having food and not eating and not having my nutrition right gonna benefit me running an extra mile? Gonna benefit me doing all these extra reps and sweat my butt? Like, I didn't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I would try to, to get extra development, but I was, it was self-guided. Like yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know. Um, so anyway, I ended up staying in town. I was like, fuck it. It's cheaper anyway. And I was like, well, I had scored a 29 on the ACT. And so I was like, that gives me two for years. At it's pretty high. Baller. Way. Yeah. That's high. Uh, I was like, daddy, <laughs> I, I ain't even going to describe what I chose to do the night before that test anyway, but that <laughs> the was fucking, it was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I, I didn't go to sleep until six. You still got a 29. Yeah. I didn't go to sleep until six 30 in the morning. And then I had to be there. Cause you were studying genius. So point being that should have got me two free years at a community college. Okay. It, either Zane so State high. or UZ. Yeah. And so, but, but he, here's, what's crazy is what I didn't realize. My dad had a plan and, and, and maybe it wasn't a plan. Maybe it just came to him the moment I turned 18. But anyway, I was 18 at that point. Cause I was finishing high school. Most kids are 18 when I graduate in high school. Right. So I was, I didn't know it, but I, uh, so I go when I decided I was going to do that, I go is this is summertime. I go to the community college and I go to their financial counselor and I was like, Hey, I, I need help with this whole FAFSA thing. I, I, I know that that's something I got to do before I start classes here, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to approach it. And I, I guess this is why I'm still fucked up with forms, bro. That's why I have you help Dude, me with it. I, I will say <laughs> filling out the FAFSA because terrible. my parents didn't know how to fucking do that shit either. <laughs> and I'm trying to get my, you got to get your mom, your parents shit. You got to get your shit. Bro. You got to do all this stuff. It's fucking challenging. I think so, I'm that honestly the might be, that might be harder than like actually going to school yeah. for real. I didn't pass that part. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, <Tyler. laughs> So I go in there and I'm taking it upon myself to, to go and do this. Cause I was like, uh, part of me, I was like, man, I'll just ignore this form. I don't want to do it anyway. I don't know how to do it. I'm fucking dumb. Um, maybe if I just don't do it and I just show up for class, they'll be like, yeah, he's on the roster. He, yeah. He's here for class and they won't make me do it. But then I was like, well, no, I need to do it. They'll, they'll probably won't let me go to class if I don't take care of it now. And they might not even let me start if I wait too late until the semester starts to do it. So I was like, let me just go do it. It's summertime before like, maybe like July. So maybe like a month before classes start, I go in there, I talk to the financial counselor and I was like, I need help doing this. I, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. And I knew that there had to be some involvement from, um, from a parent. I was like, but I went in there. I was like, not only do I need help with this, I was like, Neither one of my fucking parents are going to put their financial shit on here. And I was like, I was embarrassed, but I was like, I don't know how else to say this. My shit's fucked up at home. I, I don't have, not, I don't have help from my parents. How can I fill out this form and work on my own? Cause I'm 18 now. Like why well, yeah. I'm an adult legally on paper. Like how can I do this without putting my parents shit on here? And she was like, ah, uh, you know, she's pulling it up. She, and as I'm saying this, she's pulling up the form. She's going to, to pull up my student profile. 
And she was like, well, it looks like you already filled out this form. And I was like, I've never touched this form. And I was like, maybe maybe it's just, maybe I don't have to do it. I was like, fuck it. Maybe they're going to I see where this me, is going. Give me that check mark. Anyway, what had ended up happening was uh, my, my dad knew that you had to do this FAFSA form. I don't know how he figured it out, but I think it was just because he was doing some research just to finagle whatever the fuck he could do. But what, what he started doing was he – in in the end, like it, it was way more than just this FAFSA form, but what he ended up doing was stealing my identity. Like, you know, when, when people say I and got, he got the money. theft. I, I think he I think he did something. I yeah. think he did something, yeah. Like, he filled it out, and he made it sound like uh, – which, by, by the way, my dad was a skilled motherfucker. He was a carpenter since before I was born. Um, he had worked in the carpenter's union, did shit on the side. He was very skilled. Like, he can, he can do electrician work. He can do plumbing work. He can do HVAC work. He can tear apart vehicles and put them back together. He could tear apart a computer and, and put it back together back in the day before all this modern ones. He can woodwork. He can he could build this commercial building that we're sitting in right now from ground up, like no blueprints. If you just told him, hey, this is the building I want, you can do it. Or if it's a house, like I've watched him build a house with his bare hands. He's a talented motherfucker, and he has a crazy work ethic, and I got a lot of respect about that. He just got a lot of shit mentally, emotionally that he didn't he didn't structure in it, and that's where it led him down that path. So anyway, point being, he didn't make what he put on paper that he said he made. He put on paper that he only made like twenty grand, so we could get financial yeah. assistance. <laughs> but you know, I didn't have no bank account. I didn't have no way for anything to for me to receive that money digitally. So mm -hmm. it, he thought, well, it'll come in the form of a check, and he'll get the check, and he'll take the money and do what he wants with it, and run the drug game. And I couldn't tell you whether or not he got that money. I think he did, but I can tell you, I didn't get no fucking money. And here's what happened with that is I was supposed to get two years for free. I didn't end up getting two years for free because even though that lady tried to help me, since it's a branch campus, all the financial shit is passed through, given a given the green light to go from the main campus, campus in Athens. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody down there gives a fuck about a branch campus, not, not 10 years ago. And they didn't give a fuck about me. You know what I mean? And so – they didn't acknowledge my ACT score because they they thought that I was involved in fraudulently filling out this form. They yeah. thought I was trying to run the system. That I I believe that lady truly tried to help me. But anyway, um, I had to end up paying for it all, and I'm still paying for that shit to this day. But it you know at least it was a lot cheaper than going to a main campus. Like it, it wasn't twenty. So you years. ended up paying for the two years, even though you qualified for the ACT, and yeah. your old man basically stole the fucking fast one money. That's right. So basically, That's right. fucking bullshit. That's right. That's right. You would have got because I got the max yeah. amount of financial aid. They give you every fucking loan option possible. Mm -hmm. Did did he take out the loans too, or was it just the extra grants that basically financial aid says take that? Because they they'll give you up to like yeah they'll, for they'll, sure. they'll give you over like ten grand per semester for sure in loans for sure uh, no no he he took money out my name um, I I bought I bought a car on my own and he and mind you like in the background of all this he was in and out of jail he was in and out of prison I don't know how I don't know how a motherfucker gets out of prison so damn quickly as much as he did but uh, it was. It was plenty of times, excuse me. And um, so all the while this is going on, I'm living like I th there's so many things I skipped over. But like point being, I didn't just wait until I was in college to start living and sleeping on my friend's couches. Like I said, I, I, I stayed at Chase's house so much, even in elementary school and junior high and high school. I, I was like, well, if I can't stay with my buddy or, or if this buddy of mine doesn't want me to stay there anymore because I've been there too much, I'm going to go stay with this buddy. You know what I mean? And I would just figure it out, mm -hmm. you know. And this was on school nights. This was, like, on, on whatever. And uh, so by that point, I was like, dude, I, I, I want to make this work. I want to have a relationship with my dad. I want to have a relationship with my mom. But I'm like, these people are fucking killing me. You know, they're killing me. They're here. not giving I, you any reason to want to. No. And I'm like, well, at least, man, I was like, maybe if I just totally separate myself, they'll just stop taking from me. Yeah, you know you what go. I mean? Yeah. And so I was living with my friends here and there. Um, but – what what ended up happening was my identity was effectively stolen. Uh, I would I would get I, one. Here, here's what happened. I got pulled over one day, uh, and I was like, I wasn't fucking speeding. I wasn't doing nothing wrong. I was like, 
why – and I was like, no, I don't understand why you pulled me over. It was a statey. And he was like, well, there's a warrant for – I just read your license plate. There's a warrant for this license plate. I was like, dude, you got the wrong fucking dude. I'm like, I'm just a kid. I'm just driving to school right now. And he was like, no, you're Terry, right? I was like, no, Terry's my father. I'm Tyler. That ain't me. And I was – and I, this whole time I didn't see it coming. I was like – I was like, no, man, I'm telling you, I'm getting out of here because, like, that that ain't me. And he was like, well, son, just so you know, like, this license plate reads Terry. It don't read Tyler. I'm like, it's in my name. That's impossible. Well, from that from that point, I was like, he, he let me off because he was a statey. He wasn't, like, within the, the county jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was a state highway patrolman. So he was like, he must have realized something was fucked up. He let me go. And I, I didn't truly realize what had happened at that point. <clears throat> but what got me again, maybe, like, Within the next month, I was walking back up to the parking lot after class was done for the day, and there were, there was a county sheriff in the parking lot sitting right next to my car. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? I was like, did somebody leave some weed in my trunk, and I just don't know it, and they're sniffing yeah. my shit out? <laughs> yeah. And uh, and he's like, you're, you're Terry? And I was like, no, you know I'm not Terry, because actually the county sheriff was an older dude. He was, he was probably like Chase's age. Uh, from Philo, I was like, you know, I'm not Terry. I was like, you know who I am, motherfucker. And he was like, bro, I hate to tell you this. And he's like, I'm not going to do anything today because I want to help you out. And I, I can get, I can read the writing on the wall of this situation because he, this dude, probably everybody in the county sheriff probably knows who my dad is. Yeah, I'm you sure. know what I mean. And he was like, but I'm telling you, I think what happened is, I think your dad found out a way to forge the title for your car to where the ownership is in his name. So then, if the ownership's in his name. He can't take a title from from that's in someone else's name and go get a loan against it. It has to be in his name. So he forged the title, put it in his name. So they thought, took it to a loan shark, got money and leveraged against my car. And it, you know, it wasn't an abundance, but it was like twelve grand. He just got a quick twelve grand, real quick. You know what I mean? Like, here's a title. Fuck it, I'll pay you back. Don't worry about it. Loan shark is like no problem. Twelve grand, cash in hand. He's out the door. He but ain't this, paying it back. No, 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 no. Guess who had to pay it back? Yeah. Because I didn't want my fucking car going. I paid it back. You know who's fucking stupid for paying twelve grand though and not just buying some beater for like two grand again? Like I probably should have. <laughs> Me. Anyway. <laughs> but but I was like, I ain't let this motherfucker take my car. I'm keeping this thing. But anyway. Um So you've so how much in the school loans, Tyler? What did it end up being? Like forty seven grand. So he stole forty seven grand. That's that's what ended up being for me to get through school even after after getting some people in a grant here and a scholarship there to hear my story and for me to tell them. But you had to fight for I it. I had to fight for it. That was after that. But honestly, like 18 grand. That's about what it cost you from 18, him. For, from him, 18 yeah. grand. Yeah. yeah. Damn. And then another 12 for the car and all this crazy shit. You know so, I mean? I mean, besides the fucking trauma of your whole fucking childhood, yeah. he also cost you. And that's as an adult or trying to like get to be an, a, a, an effective, just normal adult, yeah. another like 25 racks, bro. I'm climbing up and I'm like, I see the top of this hole I'm digging myself out of. And then I'm like, I'm looking down to make sure I got my footing. And then when I look back up, I'm like, that just got taller. Oh uh, yeah. That hole to dig myself up just got taller. just got deeper. Um, he gave you every reason to try to not want to be the guy that you are. Yeah. And you didn't let it. I took that shit personal. Yeah. It's good. Good for you, dude. I took it personal. Um, and anyway, talk, talk j- just to just to throw it out there too, like because uh, because I'm, I'm talking about people rolling up on me this time, and you know these two times it was it was law enforcement. I had I had several times where drug dealers that my dad had bad ties with and owed money to, or like he stole a car from them or something like that. Uh, they they pull up on me at school. They're like what's up like we know you're terry's son i was like bro i ain't got no ties with him but they were trying to intimidate me and everything and fucking with me just because they thought it would get back get back at him or they would find a way to get their dealings with him through me um but i remember one night i was like i was about to i was dipping out of my buddy's house um one of my buddies his parents situation was not great either like his mom and dad weren't together but it was nothing close to what mine is um so anyway he, one of my buddies, wa- who I met through Chase, he and his older brother were living at their dad's house, but his dad was never there. He was a drunk. He was always out running bars and shit too. So I would stay with I, with him a lot of the time. 
um, so I was at his house, but because they're older than me, they're off to college, they're doing this, they're out working, or they're they're out running, they're they're in the bars too, because they're 21 at this point. I wasn't. So I was staying there. I was playing. I was playing some Xbox at my buddy's dad's house by myself. No one else was there, just me and my buddy's dogs. And I'm playing some Xbox, and then it was probably like 11 p.m. And one of my my girlfriend had got off work, and I was like, well, I'm gonna go see my girlfriend now. It's like 11 p.m., 11:30. How he even found this out, I have no idea. I walk out into the driveway to get my car to leave my buddy's dad's house that has no tie to my name to go see my girlfriend at like 1130 at night. There's a there's a Cadillac, real nice shiny Cadillac. Windows, it's fucking murdered out. Windows, can't see in there because it's nighttime anyway. Windows are tinted, dark as shit. The windshield's tinted. The driver's side window's cracked by about like this much. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, is somebody giving, uh, somebody giving William a ride home? This William was my buddy's dad. He was a drunk. I was like, man, it's probably just William coming home. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk back in the house. I'm just gonna chill for a minute. I walk back out there. They're still sitting there. And I was, I was like, I was like, who can this be? What's going on? Is it somebody like, is somebody like, messing around in the car with with a chick they got or something? And long story short, it was it was a drug dealer who found out like probably just watched my car and had seen me before and knew that that was me and judged that like probably found watched me and knew that that was my buddy buddy's house and figured I would be there um and 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 uh he rolled the Cadillac window down further and he held a gun out the door and or out the window and was like what's up young man and I was like just told him I was like I don't want no trouble I don't yeah. I don't I don't want no trouble I was like I I I have no no ties with my dad I don't I don't know what's going on i don't know what you guys have between you but th- that ain't me you know what i mean and after like he he very clearly knew all that and didn't care he was just trying to pass along that intimidation mm. i dude i had no fucking idea what would ha- what was gonna happen i was i was scared for my life you know and uh just things like that things like that would happen you know things like that would happen and and all all the while I I was like, this is just my life, you know what I mean, and uh, talking about that too to kind of rewind a little bit. And sorry to everybody, this is like unstructured, off the rails. This is a lot of long winded <laughs> shit. No, but this is this is what this is it though. This mm-hmm. is it, man. Uh, that same dude that I said was in and out of prison that I witnessed my dad and him uh, doing coke together. They cornered <laughs> me. He's a big motherfucker. I mean, he had to have been like six two, two forty, just huge. Um, I went. I went back home one day to go check on my dad's house because for some fucked up reason, I thought this is my last name. I'm not running from it as, as, as much as all that stuff was going on. And he, he had subjected me to so much shit. I was still taking some pride in my name. And I was like, they're not going to fuck with me and my family. Like they're not going to, they're not going to fuck with me. And I don't care about all that shit. My last name is his last name. And like, I had that, I had that pride about, about me at that time. And I let it, I let it affect my life in some ways I shouldn't have. But anyway, because of that, I was like, it was, this is kind of a simple thing though. I knew my dad was in prison. He had just gone back to prison. It had been less than a week. So I was like, I'm going to go check on his house. I'm going to collect the mail. I'm going to make sure the place ain't tore up, shot up, windows broken. It looked cool, but, uh, that dude that I had witnessed that I just described again, he was he was sitting in his car behind the house. He wasn't even in the driveway. He drove through the yard and parked behind the house mm. waiting for somebody to pull up because I don't know if he – I think he knew my dad was in prison and he was trying to case it out. I showed up to check the mail and all that shit. I was like – I was like I, – I didn't know what to do. I was hoping he was like – actually passed out in the car yeah because i didn't see him moving or nothing i was like maybe i can dip in here real quick and get out of here and he'll be still be fucked up in his car and i can leave i went in the house uh i, I locked the door behind me but the dude broke in he uh he's, he's scary as a motherfucker oh, he's scary as a motherfucker he chased me into the back of the house and he's like and this dude he's huge he's got a gun on him he's like I know what the fuck's been going on, but, and I can tell he's fucked up. I can't, I don't know if it's alcohol. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's drugs, but I can tell he, he ain't with it. And he's telling me, he's like, I know it's been going on. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? What's been going on? But I know that he's talking about 
my dad's in prison. Yeah. And so anyway, by some of God's grace, I got out of there. He, he didn't hurt me. He didn't do anything. And I think it's because my dad must have known that something. He, he could have been going back to prison any day. He didn't have anything out. He didn't have any, any jewelry, any chains, any watches, any drugs, any money. He didn't have anything out. The only thing that that dude could have stolen was like a TV or some clothes. Yeah. And I think because there was nothing tangible there for him to steal, he was like, well, am I going to kill this kid and leave him here? Or am I just going to leave because there's nothing else for me to steal or take? And so I got out of there unharmed and everything. But, like, just once again, I'm like, I can't get away from this shit. I can't get away from this shit, you know? Was that the final straw or one of them? I mean, it was one of them. It was getting close to where – because at, at some point, what, what truly helped me close the gap and put, put some more time that was, like, somewhat interrupted into all that is my dad ended up going to prison for um, – for a couple years at one point like shortly that's what after needed that to happen. that's what needed to happen yeah um yeah but at, at one point too you know like still gonna answer your question Trav. i promise uh, <laughs> i'm probably 19 by this point and like i said I, i've never known a motherfucker to get in and out of prison not just jail but prison my dad would get in and he would get right back out in some way. And I'm like, how is this? You're thinking, how are they letting this motherfucker back out? It's probably what He's was obviously going on, out here fucking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I think was happening in retrospect, and he even told me, so my dad told me this in like, you know, in, in recent past, but I think what was happening is because he was, he was gang. He knew other people was doing other shit. He would, He'd he flip would, on people. He would flip on them, you know? Yeah. And people were like, man, he's a snitch and all this shit. But I'm like, what the fuck else? Like, you guys aren't anything. Like, he's snitching on what, you know? And so that's probably what would get him out. Um, but so he ended up, he ended up getting out. Let me ask you something real quick. But we're please, there. please. Did you know, did, was there points in time where you were like, it would just be easier to be like this? A hundred percent. And that's just what I was about to, okay, about to tell you. So he got out at one point and he got, he got back on his game. He started. You know, he, he had, a, he had a, n a new truck. He had – he but it, but most of the shit was hot. You know? Yeah, of course. Most of the shit was hot. But then he would flip that shit and sell it to people, and then he would get money, and then he would buy himself shit and had no paper trail. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, he was doing all that. He was accumulating some stuff back. He Dude, I, I, I couldn't tell – also, as many times as, as, as I'm like, I can't tell you how many times this motherfucker got in and out of prison. I ain't never seen anything like it so quick. I had never seen a motherfucker ride a Harley Davidson as crazy and as fast as he did, as hopped up as he was, and not fucking wreck. So, like, that that's just some respect real quick yeah, because yeah. he was, like, the ghost rider on that thing. But anyway, he he accumulated some stuff up again real quick, and he he didn't, you know, he didn't hide it, and he showed it off too much as he should have, but then he went, he went back to prison again. But he's got stuff now again. Well, once again, kind of – I didn't fully commit to be like, you know what? I'm fucking gang now, and I'm going to start doing this now, and I'm going to learn this shit. I'm going to sell, and I'm going to manufacture, and I'm going to distribute, and I'm going to run the game now too. But I was like, I had I had some hardness about me at this point because I'm like, fuck, I have to be. I have to be. Yeah. And when he went back to prison this time, people started stealing his shit. They would do it in the daytime when he was in prison and I was at school. And, and that wasn't my full-time home either, but I was like, fuck that shit. I ain't going to let them steal my dad's shit. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, though, you know. Uh, but what I'm about to tell you, some dude that was just a, just, just like another, he was just like some hillbilly crackhead that used to run around with my dad. He would do drywall, would do this ragtag handyman stuff. Uh, he contacted me and was like, man, there's there's these people, and if you want to go get your dad's shit back, I can show you where they live. And I was like, all right, let's fucking do it. And we waited until midnight. We waited until midnight because fucking crackheads must be in bed at midnight, right? No. <laughs> Terrible fucking plan, by the way. <laughs> no, they're actually up through six. <laughs> yeah, but, but me and Anthony, uh, his name was Anthony, me and Anthony ride out at midnight. And he took me to this one of the worst spots of Zanesville. And I still don't know why they called this place this, but he's like, it's called Neff Mansion. Neff like, Mansion? Neff. 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 Okay. Ne I thought he said meth too, but he's yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah. Neff Mansion. Okay. Like, All right, where's Neff Mansion? I was like, Mansion? This is going to be a nice fucking neighborhood. 
he takes me to the worst part of fucking town possible that I should not have been in at any age, but also 19. Like, I'm still a fucking kid, but now I'm just an adult on paper, so if I do some dumb shit, I'm going to get in trouble Facts. in the legal system. But we roll in there, and some of these dudes, some of these dudes, the, the same people that stole some of my dad's shit was, was gang. But they also was like they were supposed to be homies. So some of these dudes saw – he's like, I'll take you there. So they saw Anthony roll up and get out of the truck. And it's not like we went in and started, like, hooting and hollering right away. Anthony didn't anyway. And they saw Anthony, and they were like, oh, what's up, man? What's up, Anthony? And this is, this is every demographic. This is, this, is, this, this is white dudes. This is black dudes. This is everybody. And they were all blending. Everybody was together because they were at Neff Mansion. They were all partying. I couldn't tell you how many people were hopped up on. I couldn't tell you what they were hopped up on. But they were getting down. And some of the people are inside. I can hear some chick getting fucking railed in an open window upstairs. I see, like, blue party lights going on. There's some people in the lower story. But where we rolled up at was in between Neff Mansion and the, a garage behind it. This is the shittiest mansion I've ever seen in my life. It's a, one of, it's a crack house. Yeah. And all they do there is squat and party and do crack. But it was a mansion. It was just a two-story house. Okay, got it. In, yeah, in the worst I part just, of town. I just trying to get to, right. to, to them. Trying to get yeah, to them. them was a mansion. Mansion. I got gotcha. you. It, it was it was some of the worst shit you've ever seen. But anyway, we pulled up and they were like, "Oh, what's up, Anthony?" Because they they didn't think anything of it. They were like, "Oh, we know him. He's gang. He's fucking, you know, dapping him up and shit." And uh, and then they were like, "Anthony, who got with you?" And then I I'll never forget this. Some dude walks out of the garage and his his face freezes. He must have been one of the motherfuckers that was helping. But he, he freezes, and he's like, oh, shit, that's Terry's son. That's Terry's son. Meanwhile, like, none of these people are very big, and I'm not very big either. Yeah. But I started lifting some up. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, I was 19 now, and so I wasn't 155 anymore. I was probably, like, I was bigger than I am now, honestly. I was probably, like, 185. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, – so I was like, I'm sick to them. I'm six one. I'm a little bit of a bigger dude. I'm bigger than my dad is. You're starting to look threatening. I'm starting to look threatening because they're they're You're fucking crack crackheads. Yeah, they're yeah, dangerous. Yeah, but they're fucking crackheads. Well, yeah, because they got nothing to lose. They ain't bro. big. You know what yeah. I mean? They, You're also no, probably no. sober too, and they probably recognize that. Yes, yeah. a thousand percent. And I was pissed. I was like, I run, and they were like, oh shit, that's Terry's son. And then two more turned around, and I felt a slight shift in everything. I was like, fuck, I'm in trouble because there was like eight of these motherfuckers outside, and. I had a gun on me, and uh, and I showed it to him, and and I was pissed. I was like, "Show me where the fuck my dad's shit is, and tell me who the fuck took it." And what Anthony and I are gonna do is we're gonna leave. Y'all are gonna give us my shit, and we're gonna leave. And if you guys want to keep partying at Neff Mansion, that's what you're gonna do. I had never done anything like that before. <laughs> Did they listen? No shit. They gave you your shit back. <laughs> Damn. I drove my dad's truck home. No. Anthony followed me home. We got out of there. No, <laughs> Wait, no, they, nobody they followed took, us. They either. stole his truck. Yeah, stole his truck. It was in the garage. You know what? Before one crazy story, but what you said before you told that story was nineteen years old. Yeah. And if you get caught doing that, you're I, in the same fucking system. But that's exactly how it happens, Tyler. It Usually, is, it is how much it earlier. Yeah. Because of what you saw. Yeah. But that is crazy that you were that close. I was to repeating it. I was. That's unbelievable, dude. You know what's crazy though is like I I had that conviction about me and at that point and I was truly pissed and, yeah. and I had convinced myself I was ready to go and do something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I. Well, also the lead up to that, you're you're worn down, bro. Yeah. Like I mean, this is your reality. It's yeah. not like you were like half, that was half your reality. It was your everyday reality, bro. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, anyone could get to that point where they're like, want to get. Once again, you're you're grabbing for something. You want pride. You want pride in your name. You don't want them to take advantage of your dad. Like everybody just wants to be yeah. like that, bro. I yeah. mean, it's a, for sure. It's unbelievable. But anyway, honestly, what what had what like the final straw that I when I especially stopped doing that shit. Like I knew it was wrong, and I knew that that wasn't the path for me. And, you know, and then the next day I pretended like the, the sun was up. It was a new day. I was normal again. I was going to go study. I was going to go work my job. I was going to make some money. And I was just going to be a kid trying to make it. You know, I pretended like that shit never happened. Uh, but they probably never pretended like that, though. No, 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 no. Yeah. And 
not only like that truck wasn't the only thing stolen by the way so s- honestly a couple of those people i think because I don't, I don't know what all they saw my dad do i don't know what all like what respect they did or didn't have for him there were so many of them so it's not there's no telling if like all of those dozens of motherfuckers that he was running around with. I, I have no idea if every single one of them all agreed to go steal my dad's shit. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was like one or two of them. Sure. And then the other half of them had respect for my dad. But whoever that dude was that walked out and froze up and was like, oh, shit, that's Terry's son. Like I said, I don't know what, what they saw my dad do to earn that respect about them and to, to be like, all right, we, we can't we can't do this to him. Um to, to get him to listen and comply and give me his shit and tell everybody else, like, we're going to let them leave. We're going to let them take it. But so a couple of those dudes, probably the same ones that gave it back to me so smoothly, um, had also helped track down a couple other motherfuckers that stole my dad's Harley. And I was like, well, if I, if I got that to work one time, <laughs> I'm going to do the same shit to these motherfuckers. I'm going to go get his Harley back. So here's what I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know anything about any of these people, but I didn't know who the main dude was that stole my dad's Harley. I did. I thought I was going to his crib or his shack or wherever. I was going to one of his girlfriend's places, and I it was midnight again, one in the morning, and I was beating on his girlfriend's door, and she didn't know what's going on. And she called him. He wasn't there, but she called him to find out later. And uh, and he pulls up on the curb and is peeking around and then sees that it's just me and my dad's brother at this point on the fucking story. They pull up in the driveway. They get out, and they hit this dude had a fucking Mac-10 all rigged up. and was like, what's up? Like, you're here trying to fuck with my girl? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I ain't here to talk about your girl. I ain't even here to talk to, talk to you about anything. I'm like, you just, you stole my you stole my dad's Harley. Like, we're just here to get it back. You know what I mean? And basically, he was like, you're, you're going to have to bang if you want to get that back. And this dude was giant. He was giant. So he rolls up with a Mac-10 and just lets you know, like. He let, he let me know. You yeah. ain't about that life. I ain't about I ain't about the life he was doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that motherfucker was covered head to toe. He was, like, easily 6'3", 2-something, yatted up, probably gang, got a, got a, I knew it was a Mac-10, you know what I mean? And I was like, fuck. I was like. Ain't going to work this time, Tyler. Ain't going to work this time. You know, yeah, yo. but but if this dude was like, I don't know, like, you know, 15, 20 years older than me. I knew he had just got out of prison and shit. He was like he was a hard dude. You know what I mean? And I was like, all right, y'all keep the Hartley. Yeah. Y'all, so y'all you just be like, all right, I'm dipping. <laughs> yeah. and I was he like, just let you walk away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I walk and, and this was in the same part of town that, yeah. that I was just describing. Um, And so anyway, I just, you know, I saw. The, the I saw more sides of that whole game real quick, and I was like, "Man, fuck all this shit." You know, all fuck of that, all, this all of this stuff that he's describing is still happening so often today. in so many places today. Today, today. it's unbelievable. Yep, it's wow. crazy. All right, so so college was awesome though. College was all right. <laughs> college was all right. So I just you know yeah. yeah would anyway. you fit, would you did you graduate with a four year degree? Yeah, so anyway, uh, I'll, I'll condense this one down. No, you're All fine. that shit happened up until college, right? Um, so I went to OUZ. Uh, that, that girl that I thought I was going to be together with forever, we broke up um, after my first year of college, so that was great. I, so I stayed at OUZ, went there for a semester and a half. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I, I didn't know what degree I was going to get. I was like, I'm just going to do engineering. Engineering sounds right. I'm going to do it. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to start school, and I'll figure it out after I start. I went to the branch campus of OU in Zanesville for three semesters. Um, on that same campus is a two-year community college called Zane State. Um, I was like, they, I recognized a two-year engineering degree that they offered there. So after three semesters on this side of campus, I went to this side of campus to Zane State. Uh, went there for three more semesters. It took me three years to get an associate's degree just because of all the timing and they don't offer all the classes you need every semester. Um, and so I ended up earning a two-year degree in petroleum engineering. And then I, I was like, the more I got through that, by the time I got to the end of my two-year degree, I was like, 
I should probably ask my professors what kind of a job I could get with just a two-year degree. Yeah. And it was my last semester before earning that. And they were, they were telling me, and I was like, fuck, man, I don't want to be a truck driver forever. Yeah. And they were like, it'll just give you a better chance, basically, because you have this two-year degree rather than them training you from the ground up. But the jobs were still, like, very, very minimal. Yeah. So I was like, well, I ain't doing that. I ain't going to be a fucking truck driver after I just went through all this shit, spent all this money, got this education. And I was like, I know I'm just, I didn't turn my nose up to it ever, ever. Yeah. Any of the blue collar shit, because like I said, I worked so much crazy shit even through high school just to pay for my lunch money, right? Um, so long story short, I was like, I got to keep going to school. Uh, so not far from there, in the same county is Muskingum University, which shout out astronaut John Glenn, that's his alma mater, yeah, it's where yeah. he lived, where he grew up, fighting muskies, <laughs> yeah. fighting muskies. Um, I went to Muskingum University immediately after my associate for just three more semesters. Um, so in total, I, I I sped it up to earn my bachelor degree because I had actually taken more credits and more classes than what was needed for the two-year degree so i carried that with me mm -hmm. and then um you know so point being like for an average bachelor degree it should really only take four years it took me four and a half it just took mm -hmm. me an extra semester yeah. is all so i got um, my associate's degree in petroleum engineering got my bachelor's in petroleum geology it's the same stuff just opposite ends of the spectrum of one another um there and then you know i also didn't realize that if you're going to be in oil and gas, you're so blessed to have right in your backyard in southeastern Ohio where I was living, there's there's abundantly rich oil and gas resources. Yeah. And this so second, you didn't plan that. It just that no, would, yeah. No, it just, just kind of, you know, happened that way. And so then I got to the end of my education. I was like, well, got to get a job now. And it's got to be, it's got to be for my degree. So uh, like 30, 40 minutes away from where I was living in Zanesville, uh, in Cambridge, mm -hmm. there, there was a company that had a field office there. Like their headquarters, like most of the oil and gas companies, their headquarters are in Houston or in yeah. Oklahoma city. Um, their headquarters for this company was in Oklahoma city, but they had, that was their, that was their main like financial office. They had their resource or field office, which means where they did all their groundwork was in Cambridge and Southeastern house, Steubenville, all the way yeah. down to, you know, Pike and and everywhere, uh, all the way up and down the Ohio Rivers, all the all the assets. This is where all the oil wells were. Mm -hmm. um, come to find out, that company was the second largest or second best producing of oil and gas uh, private company in the whole United States at the time. So I was like, that's where I want to go. Yeah. I want to go work there. Um, so I knew a dude who was basically, he was a well tender. He went to Philo. He's like three, four years older than me, but he worked there and he went and he would be the person to check on the oil and gas wells. I told him like, help me get a job there. I don't care. I got two and a four year degree. I got a couple certifications to go along with this show. I'm just like, help me get a job. Uh, I was committed to going and doing what he was doing. I was like, I'm going to start from the ground up. I'm just going to learn from all these people. This is, this is my out. This is my out. Yeah. You know, I'm finally done and I'm moving on. Uh, they, they were They had me set up for an interview. I went and did the interview a couple of three months went by. They never even said anything to me. I was like, fuck, I didn't get it. So I kept hitting them up and I was, I was like, Hey man, you gave the same dude I was talking about that I had previously known from going to, going to school. I was like, you gave me your work email. And I noticed it was the first initial. And then their last name at the email. I was like, is, is everybody who works at, at the company is I've that done, how it is yeah i've done this before <laughs> so i looked up like some of the top managers in the company and i emailed every motherfucker i could find I, and Love i was it. i was yes. just hoping that i was fine spelling their name right hoping they would see it because it's an outside email yep. i'm emailing from like some hot mail i got from you know middle hot school mail. i love it i still got that today yeah Zaddy. and so one of them actually got back to me one of them actually got back to me it was like just keep in touch and we'll figure something out and probably about a month later after that, um, he messaged me back and was like, I think I've got an open opportunity. It's not what you interviewed for, but if you want it, you should consider it. And I was like, I don't care. Just I'll take it. Yeah. I'll be there whenever you want me to be there. <laughs> and so I got in there and I was like the youngest or second youngest person in the whole company. Um, most of the people that worked there were from like Penn state or from like, uh, Texas or LSU. Mm -hmm. So big oil schools. Right. And so I was like, I felt lucky just to be there. Cause I had Podunk, OUZ, Zane state, Muskingum university right there in Southeastern Ohio. I didn't have all that crazy stuff that they were pipelining in. Cause they would go to these schools and recruit people Damn. from these big time degrees to go and work there. And so, um, 
I was just like, well, I'm in the door. This is what it is. So my job, I was what was called a production control engineer. And of course, I'm the new, I'm the low man. That, that, um, that role, the production control engineer role, had to have 24-7 monitoring. So I was just one of multiple people that worked that job. And so it was 24-7. It was 12 and a half hours this person would work night shift, and then day shift would come in and overlap with one another. That way you could debrief. You could tell them what happened during the night, and then day shift would work 12 and a half hours, and then night shift when they came in. You're watching would, production all day. statistics. Yeah, yeah, I'm watching pipeline pressures. I'm watching individual pressures of every oil and gas pad out there. Um, I'm watching pipeline pressures of, of other companies like Marathon mm-hmm. that we send our assets through. Um, I'm watching cameras on oil and gas pads. It was crazy. One, one night I was working night shift and it was like 3 a.m. And the cameras just rotate through and you just don't even have to touch anything. They'll just they'll show this one for 10 seconds, shifts to the next one. And I've seen this camera and I'm like, oh, shit. This whole oil and gas pad was on fire and there, there wasn't nobody out there. And I was like, it's 3 a.m., we got like graveyard shift out there. We got like not that many people running around. And so I called the main like manager out there in the field at nighttime. And he's like, dude, I ain't nowhere close to that pad. You need to call 911. So I was like, I feel like I shouldn't call 911. I feel like I should, I should call the superintendent first just in case, because what if I call 911 and I get him in trouble? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, that that's kind of what the job was like. So I, I was on night shift for, six months uh someone quit i stepped into their role in day shift and i had eventually become like the lead of that whole room so there were there were two people on my rotation so there'd be day shift night shift you'd work four days on uh for you know 12 and a half 13 hours a day and then after those four days the next two people would come in one person on day shift one person on night shift Mm -hmm. and they would work there four days at that point tyler were you starting to obviously get like all right my my life's about to be very different now. I've got quality yeah. job. Yeah, I made it through the fucking mud for yep. real. Yeah, it's like I've got structure. Yeah, uh, were you starting to like? There's bright spots now. Like, yeah, I felt like there was definitely. Whereas times before, where I had maybe been questioning or didn't believe that I would ever get a breath of fresh air, I was yeah. like, okay, there is more stuff there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I I knew it. I knew that I didn't stop pursuing something. And just, just commit to something, which was school, and complete it and see it through. I knew that I was keeping hope just a little bit for some reason. Yeah. And I was like, this is this is a proof as to why. How you know? old were you when you started there? Uh, 20, I had just turned 20, I was 23. I was okay. 23. And yeah. then I'm assuming Mackenzie entered the picture not too long after that? Or? Actually, I started dating Mackenzie right, when I, right after I turned 20. Right after oh, I turned shit. twenty. Okay. I didn't so honestly, that. I tried to keep her away from all that shit, but she saw some of that stuff that I didn't want her to. You know what I mean? Yeah. And she, you know, she, yeah, she she saw it, like that whole bit that I described of like going going down and and chasing those people down. Like she, her and I were basically dating at that point, and she so she saw. So she's row with you from the for a while, <laughs> for, sure, yeah. for sure, man, yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. And so anyway, yeah, so I did that for six months. Um, uh, then I started day shift after six months. I did that for about another year and a half. Um, but probably about just over a year. I had probably been there for just over a year at this job. And I saw the Max Effort Instagram account post something that said, hey, we need a new intern. If you're interested, reach out to this. It's probably like the customer support email. I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not an intern. I'm not like a fresh high school graduate looking for my first job type of thing. But I was like, I had been buying. Uh, th- this was probably like late summer of 2019. Okay. I, I had been, I, I was buying muscle farm stuff mm-hmm. when I could in high school. Sure. I followed Corey G Fitness. I followed you, what was going on. Um, I saw like, as soon as you guys announced Max Effort was your new thing, I was yeah. like, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm buying my yeah. supplements from. Um, so I had been buying Max for a couple of years already. Um, so, so I was did you like, start following some of the stuff in the MP days, Tyler? Oh yeah. Like the one I started lifting weights, I got introduced uh, into into weights a little bit by like some of my older friends, but like I just went to the same gym with them. But I got introduced to weights by this old dude who used to be a competitive, all natural, respect bodybuilder, yeah. Big Mike. His name is Big Mike, and uh, I 
was like, well, nobody's really telling me what to do. So I saw your workouts on Twitter. So I was like, I'm going to do this get swole shit. Hell I'm, yeah. I'm going to get swole. The fucking Twitter workouts, bro. Yeah, man. I wouldn't know any of you guys if I didn't do the Twitter workouts. Facts. Yeah. That was also uh, like early Twitter too. Twitter was a different time back then. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So I, and then one day I was like, one of my favorite workouts was I saw Jarvis Landry arm workout. I was like, this motherfucker's <laughs> got balloon arms. Oh, I'm like, yeah. I'm doing this shit. Was it the Laurent, one that Laurent Landry? Yeah, was it the one yeah. that yeah, was, oh, sorry, sorry, was, it, was it the twenty eight method workout? Oh yeah, or, or arm dude, any oh, yeah. like any wearing dude. like receiver gloves in the pictures? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. he came to the gym the one time and his arm was bigger than my leg. Yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, fucked up, dude. I I it's did those workouts specifically because I was looking for football training, and yeah. that's the motherfucker that showed up. I was like, all right, yeah. I'm doing this. And they were football workouts, by the way, I know, and I know. bodybuilding I know. workouts, <laughs> which is why I think he wasn't in the league anymore. Yeah, it was awesome. So all I knew how to do was like bench and arms yeah <laughs> that's all you need yeah yeah, yeah for true. sure so uh <laughs> so i had started doing that uh to answer your question i had been buying max supplements for a couple of years so i was like and I, I at that time i didn't know like i had read your book mm -hmm. um i had ordered your book when i was still in high school um it was it was probably one of the first versions of uh mindset manual yes yeah. yes and um so I, I was like, oh, shit, this guy's like actually – he's an Ohio guy. Mm. I was like, what part of Ohio? And I, I read from out there. I was like, no way. Mm. So, like, you're southeast, east Ohio. I was like, that's fucking awesome. So I, like, made that connection. I was like, I'm buying from this dude from here on out. Hell, yeah. And uh, so – but but I did not – point being, I did not realize even at that point, I did not realize that the headquarters or the office was so close to Zanesville. Yeah, it was it was in Newark. Newark, yeah. But then I I read it on the bottom of one of the tubs. It says manufactured for Max Effort Newark, Ohio. I was like, no way. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't make that connection until after I had already saw the intern thing on Instagram. That's huh. hilarious. Because, so when yeah. I reached out, I was like, I don't know what I can do for you. If I can do something remote over the computer, like, yeah. can I help out? Can I just learn? Like, I love Max. I want to learn about the company. I want to learn how the supplement company works. Mm -hmm. Um. And go from there. So, so yeah, so I reached out, and then shortly after is when I saw that on there. And I was like, damn, so I can actually go visit and drive to this place. Um, so they were like, it was, probably, it was probably Pontius at the time, had responded. It was like, yep, show up at this day. Here's the address. Um, just just come. And I was like, okay. I don't know what to expect. <laughs> I, brought a, I brought a resume and a manila folder. <laughs> had a was, I, was I there? What would you wear? No, no. no. Uh, yeah, I had uh, – I had dress shoes on that I that I yes. bought for my interview for my career job <laughs> that's yeah. amazing uh, I had a polo that they gave me at the day that I got hired tucked in all that shit hair combed resume handed it to Pontius he was like I could tell he's like what are you yeah so, hold on. <laughs> so hold on. why are you giving me a resume so hold on I have a question because so, so I, I got we got to break down the max effort office yeah. then is now way different oh, than yeah. compared to what it is now yeah at that point I was traveling going to the office twice a week because I was still in school yeah G basically hardly ever went to the office yeah. so most of the time it was Pontius in there uh were you there too I was there every day at that time. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Day, so, so Trey's yeah. there because uh, Trey, was, you just started your just, internship then. Yeah, it was yeah. at that time. It was just me, Pontius, like just me and Pontius were the only yeah. two people that were there like, all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was there like twice or three times a week. So, yeah. what, what what was your thoughts whenever you walk into that office? Well, well it was a fucking train wreck. First off, yeah, it was yeah. a train wreck for sure. Um, <laughs> is, is is that what you thought? <laughs> is that what you thought? Because I was thinking oh, that. Oh yeah, I walked in. I was like, man floors vacuum they got like the there's boxes everywhere yeah. i remember yeah. him like asking me like he's like is it always like this yeah. like yeah. That, like the, like the bathroom <laughs> yeah dude <laughs> really bothered you didn't just you? uh yeah. shout, just a, a little disclaimer we weren't actually putting the supplements together there we were just packing orders yes absolutely house. absolutely yeah. Yeah. like it's i just want to make sure people think we're disclaimer. making yeah, yeah making the supplements there we were literally taking them from the box yeah from they were made and putting them in the sacks <laughs> and an important distinction Corey had instilled trust in the management of this facility go. and he was handling other business dealings that didn't <laughs> allow him to be there 24 seven. So that trust had slowly dwindled because whoever was housekeeping this place didn't have the proper training. So See, there's how he you wasn't articulate it right that. there. He wasn't, he wasn't knowingly allowing all that. So anyway, but it, but it was no job. Tyler's our like, operations guy now. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember shortly after that, um, I was, I was like, well, no one's taking the fucking trash out. I'm like, very clearly a long time like there's chipotle falling on the floor i was like i'm just gonna clean up this trash and take it out and trey was like are you taking the trash out right now and i was like yeah ain't nobody else gonna do it so i might as well do it i don't care <laughs> so i just remember that and uh 
But I was like, well, this is cool. It gave me something to do because shortly, shortly after, like, like I said, I, my, my goal at my job was to get out of night shift. I was like, I'll take it. I'll do it. I'm, I know how to shut up and, and do what I'm told. I'm coachable. I was like, I'll do it. But then after doing that, I was like, man, I'd really like to be on day shift and hang out with my friends on my days off and do some do some cool stuff and not be like, you know, a vampire. So I got out <laughs> of day shift. And then once I was there for about another year on or pr- probably about that time when I was pursuing the whole max thing, like just just to be curious, I was like, well, I would go and talk to my supervisor and then I would go talk to his supervisor and then I would go talk to his supervisor. I was just working my way up and I was learning the chain of command. Uh, because I didn't see any of these people on night shift before, yeah. but then on day shift, I was like, okay, I can put a face to that name. I see this dude is, I'm always on emails from him and I was learning the structure. And meanwhile, more than 50% of all of these dudes in, especially I was in operations in a department there naturally. Um, they were all former military. Mm. Some of them, even special forces, they were serious yeah. and they took their shit serious there was no funny business i hardly ever saw them crack a smile or laugh some of them no one was ever joking no some of them hated each other <laughs> and i was like oh man so that i had to be serious and i had yeah. to be proper i had to come correct every day some of them would like make fun of me and try to weed me out i was like i ain't going anywhere so this is exactly where that all comes from mm-hmm. you had to adapt to that to that for sure that makes sense that that allowed so i already had some routine and some schedule about me and structure but like that was the test to where if i wanted to become more of that mm-hmm. that was that that was the opportunity for me to take mm-hmm. that next step got it you know what i mean mm-hmm. and so i further refined and and grew and added to all that and that helped me mm-hmm. add to that um so anyway, but, but after that time I would go to, like I said, my supervisor and one up the ladder and I would just tell all of them, I'm like, I'm not complaining about my role, but I was like, I want to learn more. I want yeah. to do more and it will help me. I'll do whatever I want to believe in this company, what we're doing. I'm passionate about this. I got my education in it. Let me do more. And most of them told me no, you know, most of them was like, nope. And it was very much of like, you need to wait your fucking turn because everybody else went through shit to do what we're doing right now. And you need to not worry about it. So I, I was like, well, I'm going to leave. It was a, the, the building was a big square and this edge of the square was, was operations. So I left my wing of the building and I went down this part of the square and I went to the water and waste department and I found the supervisor there. I was like, Hey, introduced myself, explained my degree, explained what I'm doing, kind of gave him the idea that I had to fight to get in the door. And I was like, can I work on my days off for your department for free? Like, can I, can I learn from you guys? Can I, can I learn how this department works and how I can better help your department if I can't help operations or something? So that's where, um, I got my first opportunity outside of my role, but it was obviously for free. Yeah. And so I would go out, they would send me in the field. I would go work on my days off for my normal role but for nothing, for nothing. And then I would go out there and I would, I would help dudes lay water pipeline. I would help them run equipment to dig trenches under like County roads. So like if they were developing or building a new oil and gas pad, they would have to tear up like paved roads. They would have to tear up back roads and I would help them do that. When they would refill it in, I would be the person to tamp the gravel back down yeah. after dragging the pipe through the, through Did the some road. of your superiors and your other things start to figure out you were doing this shit, Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. Were they kind of like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Yeah. <laughs> a couple of them, like my boss's boss or maybe even two bosses up were like, why the fuck are you doing this? And who's allowing you to do this? And you need to stop doing it. Yeah. I figured they would probably stop that shit. Yeah. But my direct supervisor was like, basically like rock on. Like mm. keep learning, you know, that's what I mean? cool. Yeah. And so I kept doing that for a while, but eventually, uh, I had this one day, I think I got a little bit of like the dude I was working with was, was a contractor that my company at the time paid this other company mm-hmm. to go do their water pipeline stuff. And I ran with him and he just took me around all day and I was like, I'll do whatever the fuck you want me to do. I ain't like the rest of these fucking young kids coming out. I mm-hmm. promise you. I think he kind of read between the lines and quickly realized that I'm not some just like yuppie kid that's yeah. just doing whatever and got pipeline there from a fancy school. But I found out after being with him for like a month on my days off, he was at ex con. And I think he read between the lines. He's like, I, I understood some of his culture, why he did shit. Like he would, he would not wear his proper protection equipment. He wouldn't wear his PPE. He didn't wear a hard hat. He would take off his like flame retardant clothing and he would just be wearing a beater underneath. He had all these tattoos and he was just like, he's like, fuck those guys and their rules. And he's like, we're going to get this shit done. And some of his crew left for the day. Yeah. that was supposed to help him because it was raining. 
But I, I was like, well, I, even if I wanted to go somewhere, I can't because I rode with him. So I stayed with him after hours one day, and we worked for probably like 13 hours instead of what what they thought would be 10. And he was like, you make sure – he was joking around. He's like, a- Andy was the name of my supervisor. He's like, you make sure that motherfucker Andy – I put you down for 13 instead of 10 hours. And if you have trouble, um, you just let me know, call me and I'll tell him. And I was like, Oh, I don't get paid for this. I don't have a timesheet for what we do out here. And he's like, they ain't fucking paying you for all this. And I was like, no. And he was like, fuck that shit. Like I'm going in there. And I was like, don't go in there and tell him all this shit. Like, don't, don't go fight for a time scale for me. I was like, I'm, I just want to learn. And so he actually went in there one day, like when they had a meeting, <laughs> <laughs> this ex-con motherfucker. This is amazing. Meanwhile, he's going in to talk to a depart, walking through a department full of ex-military dudes, and I'm like, oh no, because like they don't, they they don't like him enough to hire him for our company, but yeah. they like what he gets Does, done yeah. when they don't have to see it get yeah, done. Yeah, of course. When they just outsource it, right? He's one of those guys. But he walked in there so already. A couple of them were like, oh fuck, this dude's back again. And he walks in there and he's like, why didn't you pay my man right here? And then couple bosses up he he didn't know that i was still doing it his reaction was like i told you to stop doing that shit why are you still doing it you know what i mean so quickly i was like well i'm getting pigeonholed into this position and it's not that i'm not grateful for learning in this position but i was like i don't want to keep i dude i had worked fucking christmas for so many years and thanksgiving for so many years even in school because I didn't have family gatherings all the yeah. time, even when I wanted to. So I was like, fuck, I'm going to make some cash. But then in that job, I was like, I don't want to keep working a position to where I'm like the youngest man there. I can see the writing on the wall because I can hear them in their in their meetings that they're going to only hire people from Penn State from here on out. I was like, I'm going to get capped real quick. Yeah. So I was like, I need to learn something. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do a little bit more, excuse me, like entrepreneurial, if you will sort of what we got going on here because I was like, I want just the opportunity to be able to reach out and, and have the ability to do something more creative without these bounds. When I'm only told you'll only work this here, you'll sit in that same room all day, every day for 12 and a half, 13 hours a day. And maybe within the next five to 10 and it drove me crazy. Yeah. So, um, so I was like, well, I gotta find something else. I got to find something else in the internship with the warehouse being a train wreck. You probably thought, well, I could add some value here. Yeah. <laughs> you also came at a very interesting time. Just the entire oh, yeah. history. Yeah. Like it's basically a whole different company. Then. Were you here like about a year before the change? S- yeah. So Roughly. that was, that was probably like August of 2019, early August okay. it was late summer. And then I worked, you know, when I could, cause that my, my rotation, my schedule was rotational. So sometimes I would work my four days on during the week. Yeah. Sometimes I would work my four days on like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Mm-hmm. So if I had something like that to where I was working more weekends, that's when I would, those months were the months where I was volunteering my time I got at it. max Monday through Thursday. Got right. It, got it. Or during the weekdays. So I did that from about August up until like it was probably late March. It was honestly, it was probably about this time we're sitting in right now of 2020. COVID hadn't even even really been a big thing yet. It, was, mm-hmm. it hadn't really made it all, in all the way through the U.S. yet. It was just super early where people were just like, is that stuff going to come here? Like, what's that going to look like? Nobody had any clue. Yeah. All the stores were open. Nothing had changed. Your first your first day of Max was the day that I quit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember, yeah. yeah. Yes, my first actual day. Like, like, your first, first, your first, your first yes. actual day was the day yeah, I was, quit. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was Casa there? At that time? That's when it cost, Got yeah. It. So, yeah, the, uh, the other half had already yeah. sailed. Yeah. Gotcha. So it was probably about late March, um, and I, got, I, was, I, I was working on a Sunday at my, at my old job. And that morning, it was because there, all, the, all the global rumors were very, very much swirling mm-hmm. um, about COVID and how it was going to affect supply. And China had already started to shut some things down. And other countries were like, we got to halt our production right now because we don't know what's going on. Mm. Earlier that morning, it's a Sunday morning. I'm the only one in that building, only one there because nobody works on the weekends in in the office in there. And I'm getting phone calls from places like Marathon, all the places we would send our oil to. They were like, hey, we're not going to tell you to stop producing oil and gas, but you need to stop producing because we're not sending any more trucks there because what we're having to do is when, when we send our trucks there to pick up your oil, the places we take them to to store them, we have to pay right now 
to store the oil. So we're mm. not taking any more of your shit. And I watched oil go to negative 30, negative 40 a barrel that day. Fielded all that craziness, got it under control. Later that afternoon, I probably had like an hour or two left before I was supposed to get night shift coming in. I got a call, and it came up, and I, I didn't have the number on my phone. It said Granville, Ohio. On the second ring, I'm like, that's Corey G calling me right now. I know it is. <laughs> I know it is. I picked it up. It was it was him. He's like, look, man, if you still have interest in this, I know that you, you're working when you can. You're coming in. Um, if you have any remote interest in coming and doing this full-time and working for Max and learning more in a full-time role, you should consider it. And I had made my mind up. I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So shortly after that, like – I had begun to put in my resignation letter. I had I, I probably worked for another like month and a half at my old job, maybe upwards of two months, um, to really help train the people that was gonna come up and fill in my role mm-hmm. and just send them off right. You know what I mean? I tried to give a little bit more respect to, to them and, and not just leaving in one day. Um and then it was my my last day was a Saturday there. I went right to Max, and you know what the fuck I did with McKenzie for like eight to ten hours that day? Vacuumed all the floors, yeah. took out all the trash, picked yeah. up all the shelves, and I was like, I'm gonna prime this motherfucker because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm doing this. You know what I mean? And I, I, I did that on a Sunday, and then my first real day was a Monday, and then I think that was like you said, that's when Trey was like, mm, I'm gonna step away for a minute. I, I was also there that day. Like you saying that brought up, I vividly remember being in that room, and you're like, Yep, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> I was like, all right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Tyler, you um you obviously you take less money to come yep. to a situation yep. uh, at Max with the opportunity to potentially learn and, yep. and evolve into the role that you've been, which has helped me run the company essentially. And it's like, um, one, you're going from a very structured militant situation. Like I said, I thought you were fucking with me when you came in to talk to me because you were so. I thought you were military. You could right. you, then going into what was chaos for a period of time as we're buying out the business yep. we're changing all these things yep. so it's like you grew up in chaos now you're in a, cha- a chaotic situation obviously i think i was being like real transparent on this is what we're going to do mm-hmm. this is what's about to happen but it's like did you feel like was that a tough transition because you're saying you want those things but then you were in them immediately bro and this is like not super different for me because i've been through so many chaotic situations but i don't want that shit to happen but yeah. you know i mean i dug in was like all right this is what time it is we're about to get to work but yeah was that exciting nerve-wracking like what was that like for you like processing all that it was it was exciting okay. because i knew that there were things unknown that i was committing to there you i go. was like throw them to me i was like having guns pulled on me and having yeah there you go having people be in my house waiting for me when i get home and holding guns in my head and that's more scary than shit we got going on it's like (laughs) shit yeah it's like some motherfucker named john ain't gonna scare me or intimidate me all the way down uh the the only the only feeling i had was like i could tell i could tell that you know the previous partner that was bought out was uh was not great to deal with and i could tell the parallels of the personality and how they would treat and and talk to me and I, so my nervous system and those deep depths of my brain felt that and i was like man this reminds me of communicating with my dad and dealing with other people but other than that i was like i've been here before i was like dude i'm not gonna let you like you know stare me down so to speak yeah, and yeah. i was like i'm not gonna be too scared to pick up the phone every time you call and even though i know you're calling just to fuck with me and test me on something i'm like i don't care yeah, i'll yeah, answer yeah. your questions you know i was excited i was yeah. excited and i recognized the, the writing on the wall that that that's that's where the tide was <clears> moving <throat> even before some of those concrete conversations were had um but i was like we're either going to get through this or we're going to see another side or we're going to call the shots the way that you and we want to more so. Yeah. Or I'm going to ride this out and I'm going to go somewhere else if I yeah, need to go yeah. somewhere else, you know? Yeah, that's I was cool. Because I will say from my standpoint, that was probably like the uh, most aggravating fucking time probably possible. Yeah, yeah it was like hard. probably ever like went through. I Yeah, I, I don't know. I just took it as a challenge because like I said, you – you were like, oh, I'm out. You were still going to school. So most of the time, I was there by myself. And I was like, this is actually kind of cool. Yeah. Because I didn't have the other part. He was, what, several states away. So I didn't have that personality and dynamic there physically breathing down my neck. So I was like, I'm here by myself. So it gave, it felt like it, it gave a relief of pressure being there by myself. Not because it was like, well, I can do whatever I want. But it was like, I can take, I can take a step back, take a deep breath 
learn everything about this building, optimize it, build systems, make it smoother. And I just, every day I was like, I'm here by myself. I'm on my own time. Nobody's rushing me. As long as I pack the orders and have most of them done by the time the truck gets here to pick it up, I can take my time otherwise and just ask myself questions. I'll be like, why is this here? If I know that the processes go this way and I know the truck gets there here was this no time, process. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows why it was there. So <laughs> It was there because it just was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Straight up. But, dude, I can't tell you how many times I had rearranged all the pallets in there and, like, nobody was there. And then I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> I got I to gotta move the whole fucking warehouse again. And it's like if the pallet was right here. Yeah, it was a blank slate. So, and it was cool. I was like, that's that's fine. I was like, I, I knew that there were so many unknowns that I didn't know. And I wasn't an expert in business going into that. But I was like, even from there, I'm like, I knew that there were things I'm committing to. I was like, I want to learn these things. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what I don't know. I want to know why I don't know them, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. I was like, I'll take, I'll take the challenge. I want to learn. So, I'll, I know, it I know, I know it takes fuck ups. So I was like, so as it. we're going through the process, the buyouts done, and we're looking at like a new clean slate, right? Yeah. Obviously shortly after that, Danny comes into the equation. Yeah. You're starting Shout to be out. a, you know, Cole's graduated now, Trey's back around. It's like, yeah. then you're looking at like, you got a group of fucking dudes yeah. that all have similar like mindsets yeah. and they're and we're getting ready to really like forge ahead so the one thing i'll say before that it was well because whenever i was going to the office and it was just me and tyler tyler would always be asking like is this what it's like working with Corey stuff because mm. he wasn't involved in that yeah, yeah and yeah. i would tell him it's nine day different it's completely i was like different. what you're experiencing yep. now we're both going through this together yep. but i was like it's not even close to what it can be like. Yeah, yes. he would say so that, that was going on the which entire is, time. Which is what me and you would talk about, and me and Trey would talk about. Like, yeah. if we can get Max to run like Corey G Fitness runs, it would be a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. One of the big keys was bringing Danny into the equation too. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, so I just kept. I remember you saying that, and every like I would ask you, I was like, mm. I, I I asked it multiple times, but you would say that every time, and and then after a while, I was like. I'm still committed to this. I just kept telling myself, I'm like, I can't wait until we deal with night and day difference after yeah, this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then the transition happens. And then obviously this situation being in a new, like there was a lot that hit quick. Very quick. Yeah. After the bio, here, here's the thing from my standpoint, right? Is that you guys had heard some of the stories you've heard a lot more since we've been together the last couple of years about all these crazy MP stories. But you guys got to actually watch me execute one of those stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I told you I was going to do it. Yep. I went and did it. He I did. leveraged my fucking house for it. I was fucking ride or die in the trenches, mm -hmm. you know, true. defending what I thought would need to happen, uh, preserving what I, about the brand that I loved it. I think showcasing what, how much I cared about you guys to keep you. And so like, I was proud of that because I can tell you all the stories I want, <laughs> but y'all watch me do it. Mm -hmm. And when I kept, and when I committed to it, I just, I said, all right, this is on, I'm going to do this. This is what's going to happen. And you watch it happen. So then hopefully as the quote unquote leader or main owner, now you're like, all right, I'm making this transition with the dude that said he was going to go do this. He yeah. went and fucking did it. Yep. Now, how, however many months later, we're in a fucking whole new building in a yeah. different place. Like the excitement of like, wait, this is what I signed up for. Yep. Right. Is that yeah. how it felt Tyler? Yeah. Yeah. Get, getting there was a little bit of a challenge, like you said, but, but I was like, I, I ain't backing away from none of this shit. Like, I didn't set out to do something different. Uh, well, it's different. You know what I mean? <laughs> but just bef right before that even happened, though, so, like, all that shit happens. Like, I, I, I quit my other job. I start with this one right away. Trade dips. I did ask myself a question right away. I was like, did I just join a sinking ship? I was like, what? Yeah, of course. Right? You asked me that. I remember the conversation. Yes. And so, a month? No. Six weeks, six weeks after I joined Max, and you talk about the pay cut, I, I just, for, for insight, I accepted less than half of what I was previously earning in my other job. I was like, that's cool. You ain't going, you ain't going to punk me out for like, for that. I'll, I'll earn more. I ain't worried about that right mm -hmm. now is the point. Six weeks after that, I found out that my girlfriend and I, we weren't even engaged at the time, <laughs> are pregnant. COVID is in full swing by that point because it's like late June, early July. So Store, much happening. Stores are yeah. shut down. My favorite gym I went to closed, and they said we're never opening again. I was like, fuck. I'm, I, don't, I don't care. I'm in it. Life hits you fast. <laughs> before I had committed to – before you called me and said, come work full time, I had already committed to a dude that I knew that was like, again, four years older than me. He had a truck I really wanted. And he was going to sell it. And it was like nearly brand new. So I was committing. I was like, yeah, that's fine. I can make it work with what I'm earning right now. Before I knew I was going to come accept less than half my day. <laughs> I committed to buying that truck. You know, I was paying like 
five, six hundred a month after insurance, gas, truck, all that. Six weeks after joining with less than half the money I was getting before, found out we were pregnant, COVID's in full swing. Are, is it going to buy out? We hadn't had that conversation yet. I was like, fuck. I, like, I'm trying to see all these things through. I'm there by myself most of the time. I'm like, all right. This is what doing shit in business looks like. You know what I mean? <laughs> One way forward. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, and then you talk about that and, and us being able to, you rallied us around. We rallied around you. You described those things. Um, you, you put it into action other than just describing it. And before we know it, it's like, all right, the, the paperwork aspect is done. These people are physically and should be mentally removed now. This business is fully, we have the grasp of the reins now. It's, it's our strategy. It's our business culture. It's our business strategy, all of it. And all of us were physically there more now. And I was like, okay, this is a whole new deal. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then we come to this building. You post the before and after pictures every now and again. And it's, if you don't stop and, and have yourself think about it, it's it's easy to forget all the it's different easy. components. It literally felt like it was an entirely different company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Well, it immediately felt like that. But then once we made the transition here with the gym and everything being under the same roof with the studio, like it, yeah. it felt completely it actually, different. In my opinion, it actually felt like a like a real company. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It was just like, I'm just going here. I guess I'll see Tyler and then <laughs> we just go off, do whatever. And then yeah, it was cool. show going on. I mean, it was cool, though. Yeah. I was it like, was a wild time. It was cool. Like, and, and also being there by myself was like, well, they're, they trust me enough to be here to at least fulfill part of what's going on in the day-to-day business. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. Like I, I made a decision. I'm, I'm forging this path by myself. Like no one put me on. No one gave me the, your contact. Like it was through what I described. I was yeah. like, I was pumped about all that. And I was like, this is, you know, this is cool. It was a great opportunity. So when all the things that you said that you wanted to experience and do you've got a chance to do yes i mean be in the trenches see some craziness happen you know and i post those pictures for you guys and for me to just remember like ain't been that long yeah a lot has happened for the good yeah and you know just that this environment that we now have is i mean i I, i'm i never came to the office because i'm like an not an office guy Mm -hmm. i like coming to this office because this is what we you know I've put together to, yeah, to yeah, really grow. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. And the other one was not. And actually I was forced to get that office um, in the MP days. I worked at my house. So like I was forced <laughs> to it. And so like, I've never been an office guy. I've always been more of a kind of lone operator type of cat, but I realized I needed a real group of fucking, you know, you know, what's a lot to of think this. about is I had like basically never met Danny. Yeah. Like me and Danny worked together. Danny like, worked at the coffee shop. Yeah, me and Danny worked together <laughs> since like twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. I never met him until like twenty twenty one. Yeah. I'd see him every once in a while. I called him I Danny Ferris. I didn't fucking know him, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that, that was that was before small arms. <laughs> yeah. It was Danny Ferris. You know what's yeah. funny about that is you describing you had never physically met him in person. Um when we, we got lumped into a group a group chat at the at the early point when you were like building this team. Yeah. And I asked Cole and Trey, I was like so his name's Danny because I just wanted to put a contact to the number of my phone, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, "Yeah, he just he like does stuff with the website and stuff." Like I I, I don't I don't know, and <laughs> I, I didn't know him. I didn't know him, and so you, I've you never know. met him before. That fucking guy, <laughs> I kind of know. And so I put him in my phone. I put Danny Web guy, and he's he's still yeah. in my phone as Danny, Danny Web guy. Danny's in my phone as yeah. Danny, 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 Danny MP. I'm Danny MP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, because dude, I, yeah. I'm in like classes at Ohio State, and Danny. Danny would this was it was basically like talking to like I mean just like, kinda like just, a ninja. Just like an acquaintance, he go, Hey man, like can you make this for me? Like like he had just had he was He's like, basically he, AI. Yeah, he's like I'm talking AI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but Danny's probably thinking I'm talking to this fucking nineteen year old kid. What the fuck am I like yeah. who the fuck so is this good. kid? Then Cole still randomly. saved in my phone is Cole at the gym. Yeah. That's awesome. he was like intern coming. is it is it intern still? <laughs> no, I no. just said Cole at the gym. Because I think that's yeah. originally about well, and then just randomly showing up at old school. I just pop in one yeah. morning. So good. Bro. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I, actually the only time I remember Danny before like this whole thing was whenever we were doing that fucking uh we were doing like block uh cleans or some shit like that. Yeah. I still have that video. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was <laughs> that's that video. epic. 
I just want to mention one more thing because you're talking about the gym and shit too. Like, obviously, I'm I'm not the biggest dude, and and I've let my fitness get away from me a little bit the last couple of years, begrudgingly. Um, <laughs> during that process of those about like nine roundabout months when I would work at Max on my days off from my other job, so I got up at 3 a.m to go do that job just it just another important fact i'm not beating my chest i'm just saying what it is because like this is how much i wanted to make a change right at my other job i got up at 3 a.m i if i walked in the door over there at 4 46 a.m rather than 4 45 or any time before that i was late worked from 4 45 to no sooner then 5 15 p.m most of the time i worked over so i was there no less than 12 and a half hours a day in the same fucking room at least four days in a row. The very next day when I had my day off, I would get up at, I don't know, like 2.30, drive to Pataskal at the time mm-hmm. to go to the gym because I was like, I definitely ain't lifting as heavy as these motherfuckers over here. But yeah. I want to be there, and sure. I want to be in front of you when I can be there and you can see mm-hmm. me. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. I want to do all this. And I would be at the gym until y'all were done. I was like, fuck how much more I could push through all this. These guys are in much better conditioning than me. But uh, we get I'd be there at least in the building until you guys were done. And then I would like, hey, can you remind me the address of the office? Like, what's the best route to get there? Is like, is this the quickest way I'm going? I would drive to the office, sometimes get there at 6 a.m., 6.30. Sun hadn't even come up yet. And then I was Wait. like, I was like <laughs> and oh, no one would be shit. there. No one would be there until like 9. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, well. I took it. I just took it as a challenge. I was like, "These motherfuckers ain't gonna punk me out." It's not. It's not like people were like, we'll "Make that motherfucker wait till night yeah, and get in that building." But I was well, like, "One motherfucker probably would." Yeah, yeah. which, which yeah. was true. But I was like, "I ain't gonna." Yeah. Let I mean, I'm gonna put like fucking three out. motherfuckers, honestly. Yeah. And so I was yeah. like, "Can you guys like let me get in the door? Can you? I'll just go in there and start cleaning Did shit give up." Me my key. At one point, I think I eventually, I eventually got the key because yeah. then I just let you in the door if you didn't have it back. Yeah. But I was like. I took it as a challenge. I was like, I ain't gonna let this motherfucker fuck Definitely me out. About that. Some funny I was like, I, <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't bring the yeah. energy to to Pontius or to to Alex. Like I was, I was nice, kind, professional. I wasn't in there like I'm here to take your job, motherfucker. You know what I mean? But it was like I, even when I was there for like the internship, I yeah. I, was, I never acted that way to them. I was like, mm. I'm here to help. No, I, I already respect. knew. I'm here I, to learn. I, I knew as soon as you got in, what, what was about to go down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew. I fucking. Well, you can clearly see and like hanging out with him for 15 minutes, like the skill set difference and just how he operates. Oh, uh, one million percent. Yeah, but also like all of those things and the timing um, were all supposed to happen the way they did. I, I mean, yeah. I don't. I, you know, look. At the end of the day, there was things that happened that made me understand, like, all right, I have to take, like, massive action that's going to cost a lot of money and a mm-hmm. lot of fucking stress and time. I executed it at the right time. You guys saw that, rallied around, and, and we all came for the, the same vision, bringing in the guy that, <laughs> from yeah. the internet. Web and, guy, web yeah, guy. web guy. Maybe that'll change that, my title. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you are on the, you are on, you are on the general, general web. Bro, what do you mean? Yeah, I, got, I need to update yeah. my email signature. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I yeah. think if you think about the time, we all got better through that situation because yeah. if it wasn't for that whole fucking situation, me and Trey doesn't, don't start varsity creative. Trey doesn't turn into the NFT guy. Yeah, That's web right. three. That's uh, right. King. Yeah, Tyler doesn't turn into Mr. Sea Lover. <laughs> Small Arms Danny never happens. Yeah. Mr. No. Donnie Traps, all that shit doesn't happen. For sure. Yeah. Well, and, and honestly, just the evolution to, like, my ultimate vision, which is really where we're sitting today, mm-hmm. fellas. It doesn't happen if I don't have you guys. It doesn't happen if we don't go through that situation. Um, you know, the reality was this is really what I tried to build the first time. And it turned mm-hmm. into something else, right. mm-hmm. not necessarily max. I'm talking about muscle farm. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. mm-hmm. what you, what we're doing right now is really what I wanted to do personally, but it wasn't just my call. And so when I felt like I had an opportunity to actually make that happen, I had to try to risk basically, you know, everything I could. And then hopefully you guys would then support it to go try to build it, which is what we've been doing since well, we've been in this building about two years now, mm-hmm. maybe. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, when I see those pictures and I knew it, that's what's so crazy is like, I was like, all right, I got the fucking ride or die team and I walked in this building and I knew it in the first fucking probably 30 seconds. It happened so fast. It did happen. So I still fast. can't believe how well, fast you got well, the we, money uh, together. I think, yeah, you just the came bio, up with the The idea. bio was in no, uh, November and I bought this in April. Yep. Yeah. But I'm telling you, I walked in and knew it, it so immediately. Fast. And I was like, I got to have it. 
And then by the way, that wasn't the best timing for me because I had just spent like a bunch of money on the buyout. Oh yeah. But I was like, I got it. And also it out. we had just renovated the last office. Yeah, and it looked really good at that <laughs> time too. Good, man. He yeah. put new floor you know, in that bitch, new paint. It was yeah, awesome. it looked really good, but the issues of just being in that area. Because then it also went from like oh, yeah. you you just came and checked it out. I think you took you took me, you took us here to look at it. Yeah. And then it was like five days later, like, yeah, I'm getting it. We're moving. Fast, fast. Well, the other thing is, I think you guys already saw me th do the other thing, so you're like, well, mm -hmm. fuck. This movie yeah. ain't nothing. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was, it was awesome, like two though. big wang movements. Or... Yeah, that was yeah. Sure. yeah. I literally Same. felt like back I was in like 300, basically. That's how my life felt. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you gave the chain of command that we're attacking, I was fucking in. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. That's well, literally how I felt. Well, I really appreciate that uh, because I couldn't have done it by myself. That's for fucking sure. Yeah, <laughs> it, was it was fucking, sick. it was, it was ride. Fun Black Friday. Yeah. Well, but yeah, boys, every, right. every day we walk in here still, it's like, I don't even have to think about it. It's just like idling in the back of my mind that, that we have that underlying culture and like, yeah. you know, gamesmanship amongst one another that we've all, we saw that stuff. <clears throat> we were on the same wavelength as one another through those times. And now we're here and it's like, oh man, it's just the way forward now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. We all got that. Well, we're gonna wrap it up, Tyler. Thanks for sharing those stories. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Yeah, no. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys for having me on and asking the questions. Like it's it's uh, it's good, I think, and healthy to recollect and go through these things because, like I said, mm -hmm. it's uh, a lot of these things have been coming back to me um, really, really recently. Like even as early as this morning, before <laughs> I knew that you guys were gonna ask me these questions. Uh, but I, I'm you know I'm in a good place with a lot of it, and it's like in, it's it's just the way forward. So. Thank you guys for having me. You fought for it, for and sure. you're here, kid. It was a bit long-winded, but thanks, everybody. No, 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 it was amazing. All right, Roundtable Podcast. I'm your boy, Corey G, Small Arms Danny, at Trey Speedin, the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak. We thank Tyler C. Lover for coming on the show. We are out.